All right, all right. Thank you for joining me in this episode of The Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Marlon Wilson, and we have another great show for you today. Another exciting debate. I hope y'all ready for this one, man. This is going to be straight up fire. I am excited, and I thank you for joining me. I have Dr. Layton Flowers and Pastor Gabriel Hughes, and these guys are about to jump in. And we're going to be all in John chapter 6 today. So I hope you guys are just as excited as me. But before we jump into that, I do want to go ahead and encourage you to like and follow the gospel truth. Make sure you hit the subscribe and that notification bell. If you have yet already, make sure you do that so you don't have so you can stay in the loop and you can be notified whenever we have other debates going on also all this content is not only on youtube but also facebook twitter and instagram so make sure that you are falling over there hitting the like hitting the subscribe over there as well so you can stay in the loop on those platforms as well you also have the podcast option if you rather just listen to auto audio you have itunes google play stitcher and spotify so make sure you are flowing over there so you don't miss out on any of the debates all right make sure you do that please do all right with that said i do have shows that are coming up here in the future that i do want you to be aware of all right i have our unitarians considered christians that's coming up so i think that's on the 31st of this month so make sure you are jumping on this one i have kelly powers and andrew griffin and they are going to jump on and this should be a great great debate after that, the perpetual virginity of debate was Mary Ever Virgin. I have Francis Turretin, Dan Chapa, William Arbridge, and Sam Shimon, and they're going to be jumping into the God's Truth Octagon to theologically battle it out. So make sure you guys are in tune with this one. This is going to be a fantastic debate. After that, I have my first in-person live debate that's going to be going down in Arkansas. I have Rock Kendall versus Jeremiah Nertier, the great baptism debate. All right, that's going to be going on February 11th at Arkansas State University. So make sure if you're in town, make sure you stop by and see this debate. This is going to be a great, great debate. I'm excited because this is one of the visions that I had to, that I feel God put on my heart to take the gospel truth, and that's doing live debates. We have the YouTube, the, the video, but we're going to jump into the live stage so i'm excited for this opportunity so make sure if you're in town and it will be live streamed too so no worries there it will be live streamed if you can't make it all right so i'm looking forward to this one and as you should too and then lastly i have a great debate coming a big one this is dr michael brown versus dr gary demar has matthew chapter 24 been fully fulfilled these guys are vets in this man these guys have been doing it for quite some time for a very long time and i am looking forward to this debate man and uh hope that you are too man like i said man the god's truth has a whole bunch of debates coming up whole bunch of shows coming up and you don't want to miss out on any of these shows because if you don't hit that subscribe button you're gonna miss out on them you, you can watch them after the fact you know you could watch the recording and so forth that's cool but it's something else special when you watch it live so make sure you are hitting that subscribe button and that notification bell so you can stay in tune with what the god's truth has going on right that said hey have you like i, I listened to um when we understand the text and i always wanted that voice you know, you hear the voice and you're like, who is this guy, man? You know, he does the one minute, one minute and a half, about almost two minute videos. And you're like, man, that's a great voice, man. I wish I had a, a radio voice like that. And he, he does a great job, man. And he is on, this is Mr. Pastor Gabriel Hughes. If you didn't know his name, he's on with me. And you know, Dr. Lay, everybody's favorite provisionist. You know, everybody's favorite position, Dr. Layton Flowers. So, and he has a soteriology one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and I was poking fun at him early before we jumped on, you know. I said, yeah, you'll see me in the live chat. I go in there poking the bear. I go in there poking, poking Dr. Flowers to wake him up. You know, he has that energy, but I don't think he has enough energy, you know what I'm saying? So... <laughs> So it's always fun to interact with Dr. Layton Flowers, and it's great to have these guys on. How y'all doing? Doing great tonight. I'm doing great, Marlon. Yeah. All right. Excellent, man. I'm happy, man. I, I am ecstatic to have you guys on, man. We got this debate in, on the books maybe about several months ago, and we finally made it. You know, you know when I'm planning these debates, guys, I'm like, on pins and needles, I'm like, man, you know, I plan it so far out, man. I hope it, uh, I hope it doesn't fall through, you know? So 
<laughs> it's always good to be able to see see the things come through, man. So I'm excited for to have you guys, and I appreciate you guys for joining me. Before we jump into this, I'm gonna allow you guys to introduce yourselves to the audience and everything. Somebody out there don't know who you are. Somebody out there don't know what you do. So uh, go ahead, take this time to introduce yourself. Start with Pastor Gabe. You might give a quick introduction to yourself. Yeah, so uh, I am a an associate pastor at First Baptist Church in Lindale, Texas. Tom Buck is the senior pastor here. Uh, we just moved to this area, and I became pastor here a little over a year ago. And this is uh, a, a real treat for us. Uh, the people here have been so wonderful, and just uh, another opportunity to minister with the Word of God to the people of God. Of course, the online ministry that I have is when we understand the text. WWUTT is the way that it's abbreviated. And whatever service you use to listen to a podcast, if you just type in those five letters, WWUTT, even on Spotify or through Apple or Podbean or whatever else, then that podcast will come up. It is 20 minutes of Bible teaching five days a week. We do a New Testament study Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Old Testament on Thursday. And then my wife uh, often joins me on Friday and we do a Q&A answering questions from the listeners. Now, all of this started from the videos uh, and that's really the kind of the uh, main element of the online ministry. So if you go on YouTube to WWUTT, you'll find the channel, over 300 videos there, responding to a number of different Bible topics, even putting verses in context and things like that. Uh, I've been very blessed uh, to have so many people watching those videos. I never intended that to be, like I wasn't trying to start my brand. I actually began that uh, as making videos for members of my own church in my own congregation, just the questions that they would ask and have been grateful to see so many people love the videos and play them in various different contexts. And so uh, for uh, further Bible teaching, check out When We Understand the Text. And thank you, Marlon, for inviting me on for this debate tonight. Oh, no problem, man. I thank you for coming on. appreciate it. All right, Dr. Layton Flowers, if you don't mind, give a quick introduction to yourself. Tell them what you do. Tell them who you are. Sure. Most of the people watching are probably familiar with my online ministry with Sociology 101. Uh, but much like Pastor Gabe, I didn't really start that for the purpose of being what it is today. I, I really started that for a college course that I was teaching, and I was trying to help them to understand some of the things I was learning in my own dissertation. And so uh, Sociology101.com began to grow from there and has uh, become a lot bigger than I ever imagined it would. But it's really uh, talking about the doctrines of grace with regard to the rise of Calvinism in my own convention. I was uh, self-proclaimed a Calvinist for about 10 years of my life and ended up leaving Calvinism and wrote my dissertation on the subject. And so it's, yes, it's a very niche type of ministry that's addressing these particular doctrines. But um, some people might get the impression that's all I do because that's all you see. But the reason I created Sociology 101 was really to kind of separate it from my evangelism page because that's my main job. That's what I get paid to do. That's what I'm traveling right now. I'm in a hotel room now uh, for uh, Texas Baptist because I travel uh, around the state of Texas and I do training for evangelism. Uh, we, we put on evangelism events. We just came from one on Saturday with Eric Hernandez there at, uh, at, at Jacksonville. And we put on an unapologetic conference with Greg Kokel. I mean, excuse me, um, uh, yeah, Greg Kokel and um, uh, Frank Turek was there, uh, two of my favorites uh, apologists that were there. And of course, Eric Hernandez is my top favorite. Of course, I have to say that uh, he works with me. And so uh, we, we do apologetic conferences and trainings all around the state of Texas. And so um, uh, one of the things that I, I love to do is to talk about my relationship with Jesus Christ with others. And this is an in-house debate. This is a secondary issue. And I know Gabe agrees with me on that because I've heard him say the same thing. And uh, and we we are brothers in Christ coming together and spar. We're going to be uh, firm with what we believe, but we love each other. Um, I know his pastor well. Tom is one of my favorite uh, Calvinist friends. Uh, he's a loving man here in Texas that I, I uh, appreciate his, his work as a pastor. And uh, this is an in-house debate where we disagree with each other, but at the same time, we can still be loving towards each other. We can still shake hands after this. We can evangelize together and uh, and work together as a fellow Southern Baptist. And so I, I hope that people understand that even though we're discussing and contending over this doctrine, that we can do so in love as brothers in Christ. 
All right, guys, good stuff. Excellent stuff. And so we're going to jump into this, man. There's no need to waste any more time, guys. Let's go ahead and jump into this. The topic today is what is the expository understanding of John chapter 6, verse 44? That is, we're going to start off with 15 minutes, uh, a 15 minute opening by Pastor Gabe. And then that's going to be followed up with a five minute cross examination by Dr. Flowers. And then we're going to have a 15 minute cross, a 15 minute opening by uh, Dr. Flowers and a five minute cross examination by Pastor. Hughes or get Pastor Gabe. And then we go follow with we have a sixty minute and a sixty second intermission, and then we're gonna follow up with uh, with rebuttals and a cross examination round. So that's gonna be ten minute rebuttal by Doctor Flowers, and then a five minute cross examination by Pastor Gabe. Ten minute rebuttal by Pastor Gabe, and we're gonna follow up with five minute cross examination by Doctor Flowers. All right, and then we have another sixty minute intermission, and then we're gonna follow that with two minute, ten minute closings by both participants, and then we'll have about thirty minutes of Q and A from the audience. Sounds good. Sounds great. All right, all right. So that said, Pastor Gabe, you are up first. So we let me know when you're ready, and once you start speaking, or do you want to do the greeting first, or anything like that, or do you want to go right into your opening? Uh, I'll say thanks for tuning in, but yeah, let's just, let's have at it. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Um, so as soon as you start speaking, I'll start your time. All righty. Well, I thank you so much for joining us for this debate. And I want to invite you here at the very beginning to open up your Bible to John 6, as we are going to be looking at that chapter of Scripture. And while you're doing that, I want to ex explain the reason for this debate. Why are we doing this? Well, as mentioned, I'm a pastor, and I love to teach the Word of God to the people of God. But it's very important for me that the people that I'm teaching understand the Word of God in context. Now, for pastors, we refer to this kind of teaching as expository preaching. It's exposing the text. Another word for this is exegesis, which means to draw out. We want to draw out the original meaning of the text that the original author meant to the audience that he was writing to. And when we understand those things, we can also glean what the Holy Spirit means for us to understand today. So as we come to the Gospel of John, of course, this is John who is writing this Gospel, and at the end of the Gospel, he explains exactly the reason he was writing. In John 20, verses 30 and 31, he says that, I have written these things to you so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. He has been showing that Jesus is the Christ all the way through this gospel, and starting at the very beginning, saying that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and showing that Jesus is the Word who put on flesh and dwelt among us. In verses 12 and 13, he says, To those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of man, nor of the will of the flesh, but of God. The real test for us tonight is going to be a test of consistency. Who is the most consistent in teaching this word according to what John actually wrote and what he meant for his audience to understand? Now, of course, Dr. Flowers and I have picked our categories in advance. We had to, otherwise there wouldn't be any cause for debate. As Dr. Flowers had mentioned, we both believe the Bible, and we both believe what it is that we're teaching out of John 6 is really what John meant. So it is up to you as the audience to be our judges, to come to the Scripture and test us according to what it is that we're teaching. Who is going to be the most consistent in the way that this is being taught? We would not just apply this hermeneutic to John 6, but any other text that we would be teaching out of the Bible. So we come now to John 6, where Jesus is going to be explaining to his audience why they don't believe. Again, those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You believe in him and you may have life in his name. But why were there people who did not believe? And that's what Jesus explains here in this particular discourse. We start John 6 with a couple of miracles. There's actually the fewest number of miracles in John's gospel compared to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But here at the start of six, we've got two in particular, and they're both very well-known miracles. You've heard of these spoken of since you were in Sunday school. You have uh, the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, which he does with five loaves and two fish, and still has 12 baskets full of food 
left over. This showing that Jesus him is creator himself and that he is even able to create out of nothing. The next miracle that we see is Jesus walking on the water. His disciples are in a boat on the Sea of Tiberias, also the Sea of Galilee. There's a big wind that comes up. Jesus walks on the water out to their boat. And when he gets in the boat, the wind is gone and immediately the boat is transported to the other side of the lake. This shows that Jesus is not only creator, but has the power over that which he has created. But the people who had just eaten of the bread that Jesus gave to them, they come looking for Jesus. And that's where we're picking up uh, the, uh, the narration here. Uh, this discourse that begins in verse 25. That's where I'm going to start reading. If you want to join me in John 6, 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Jesus is already saying to them right at the beginning here, you've come to me not because you believe that I am the one who is sent from God. You've come because your flesh is hungry, because you want to feed your bellies. And so they've come looking for more bread. They do not believe that Jesus is the Christ. And he's already confronting them about that with his first response. Verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Now, keep that in mind. You must uh, seek the food that endures to eternal life, for Jesus comes to that over and over again over the course of this response. In verse 28, they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. It is even God's work upon you that you believe in the Christ. And what he's going to be showing to the people here is that this work of God is not being done in them. We go on with Jesus saying in, in verse, or the people saying in verse 30, So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? And it's, it's really quite an astounding question for them to ask. They just saw a miracle performed. Jesus feeding the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, and yet they're demanding of him another sign that they may believe as Jesus said they must believe. They go on to say in verse 31, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. It was God who gave them bread in the wilderness, and it is God who gives them bread even now. And Jesus is going to refer to himself. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Now, as you've been reading through the Gospel of John, that phrase will look familiar to you because there was a woman at the well in Samaria back in chapter 4 who said something similar. When Jesus said, if you knew who was asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And as Jesus describes this water, she says, sir, give me this water always. So the people have the same response here. Now, the woman at the well came to believe that Jesus is the Christ, but that's not going to be the result of the people that Jesus is addressing here. So Jesus goes on in verse 35 to say, I am the bread of life. This is an I am statement, like God addressing Moses from the burning bush saying, I am who I am. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Keep that phrase in mind as we continue on here. Verse 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me, but I will raise it up on the last day. Another important phrase for Jesus will repeat this several times. I will raise it up on the last day. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and I will not lose any of those that the Father gives to me. Verse 40, for this is the will of my Father. We have that statement again, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. 
So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Again, they're responding with their flesh. They're responding as naturally minded persons, not with the spirit of God. So in verse 43, Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Now let's sit there for a moment, because this is really going to be at the heart of the debate that Dr. Flowers and I are doing here tonight, what we're reading here in John 6.44. Jesus says, no one can come to me. Now this book, the Gospel of John, was written originally in Greek, which we have translated into English. And if you were to look at this in the Greek language, what we have translated as two words, no one, in the Greek is just one word. If you ever want to watch a Greek scholar kind of break this down sometime, I would uh, uh, encourage you to go to the YouTube channel Daily Dose of Greek and watch them break down the sentence structure here of John 644 in Greek. It's pointed out when they do that to this particular verse that this single word here at the very beginning, which we have translated no one, this is the subject of the sentence. No one can come. No one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. The Greek word here is helko, which uh, is translated in other places in the Gospel of John as to drag. And everywhere we see uh, that word come up, there's some sort of force that's being applied to it. Like when Jesus drew his, or I'm sorry, when Peter <laughs> drew his sword, it's the Greek word helko that's being applied there. So Jesus, or, or I did it again, Peter applies a force to that sword. When Peter drags nets in a little bit later on, or drags a net in a fish, it's the word helko that's being applied there. And so we see the same here. No one can come to Christ unless the Father draws him. It is the Father that brings a person to Jesus. A person by his own will cannot come to God, but that the Father draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Still talking about the subject of the sentence. So the one who is not able to come until the Father drew him is the one who comes to Christ. As Jesus said uh, earlier, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and this is a paraphrase of Isaiah 54, 3. They will all be taught by God. And this is another way of understanding how the Father draws one to Christ. You know who Jesus is, the Son of God, the one who is sent by the Father, the one who is the Savior of the world. You know who he is because the Father has shown this to you. This is how we know who Christ is, and that is what is meant here by this phrase, they will all be taught by God. The drawing and the learning, these are different aspects of God sovereignly working on a person's life to bring them to salvation. Those who are taught by God the truth are also drawn by God to the truth, and that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me, Jesus says. So we go on in verse 46. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now keep that phrase in mind, because Jesus is going to come back to that again. As he refers to the flesh here, whether it is the flesh of the people or it is his own flesh, we're talking about the entire person here, not merely one's fleshly body, but everything about Christ. It is by faith in Jesus, in the person and work of Jesus Christ, all that he has done, who he is and what he has done, that we have everlasting life. The Jews disputed among themselves, and we see this continued dispute happen in verses 52 to 59, but for the sake of time, I'm going to jump ahead to verse 60. When many of his disciples heard these things that he had said, they said, this is a hard saying and who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, he said to them, Do you take offense at this? 
Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. And then the parenthetical reference we have there, for Jesus knew from the beginning those who, uh, who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Verse 65, And then he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. He's repeating again what he said there back in verse 44. So we have some elaboration a little bit more on that particular phrase. But look at how that's connected with verse 64. It was interrupted with the parenthetical reference, but read that again as if the parenthetical reference weren't there. Look at Jesus' answer as a whole. He says in verse 64, There are some of you who do not believe. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. He's explaining to them once again, this is why you don't believe, because you've not been drawn by the Father to me to believe. We, by our own wills, by our own flesh, even as it says back in John 1, 12, and 13, we do not come to God because we affect belief in our own minds and in our own hearts. It is the Father who shows us who Jesus is, and it is he who draws us to him. So it is only by the work of God that we come to salvation. So any man who boasts, we boast not in ourselves, but we boast in God with thanksgiving and praise that he showed his love to us and we might be saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And so we have that phrase once again in John 6, no one can come to me, Jesus says, unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. All that the Father gives to the Son will come to him, and in him we have eternal life. All right, thank you for that 15-minute opening statement, Pastor Gabe. Right now, we're going to transition to our first cross-examination, uh, and it's going to be a five-minute cross-examination. Dr. Flowers will be cross-examining Pastor Gabe for five minutes. You have the floor. All right, Pastor, do you believe that the word helco there refers to being given new life, regeneration? Yes, regeneration preceding faith, correct. Okay. Can somebody have life apart from Christ? No. Yeah, 1 John 5, 12, I think we would agree. He who does not have the Son does not have life. So then how does one get life prior to coming to Jesus? You can't have life one until does you not, have Christ. One does not have life prior to coming to Christ. Well, you have to be drawn, given new life, in order to come to Christ. Right. So correct. You have the, life the drawing or the drawing is not. Yeah, right. Uh, so the drawing is not is not. What was the very first question that you asked again? Rephrase that one Can more time. Somebody, yeah. Well, the first question I ask is, well, do you mean by Helco regeneration or given, being re reborn, given new life? And you said yes. So that means oh, yeah, being that somebody born has again. to be. Right. Somebody has to be born again, given new life in order to come to Jesus. So they would have to have life before they have Jesus. And I'm asking, how does somebody have life apart from Christ? Correct, we have life in Christ. We don't have life apart from Christ. So the regenerating, the regenerating work that happens uh, is the Father revealing who the Son is, but it is only by faith in Jesus Christ that we are saved. Now, when we talk about this in, in sort of a, a reformed sort of a context, we will say that regeneration precedes faith, because a person does not have an ability to believe in Christ unless they are regenerated by the Spirit or by the, the Father's will, as it's explained here. So the, but as it comes in a particular order, I mean, it's, it's difficult for us to say, really, that all of those things happen in a, a particular sequence. Uh, it's really quite mysterious to us when it comes down to it. All that we know yeah. is that this is a work that God has done. We don't affect it. Yeah. God is the one who does it. Well, the, I think the issue is that you, it seems to say that somebody has to be given life in order to come to Jesus. And John 540, he says, you refuse to come to me so that you may have life. He didn't say, I've refused to give you life so that you would come to me. So how do you reconcile those kinds of passages? Even the one you read earlier, John 20, 31, by believing we may have life. It seems to, you get the order backwards. You say, well, no, you have to have life in order to believe. And the Bible seems to say, no, 
You believe so as to be given new life. Well, it's a good argument, uh, but the the uh, regenerating work that is done by God in a person's heart is not the everlasting life. The everlasting life that we have in Christ is by faith, but that the person's spirit was dead and could not believe in Jesus until the work of the Father that is done on that person's heart. So it is only through that regenerative work that we have life in Christ. Well, regenerating life is eternal, isn't it? I mean, once you're regenerated, that is eternal life, isn't it? Yeah, again, it's the the order of events is uh, difficult for us to fathom or to understand, but what we have according to what is said in John 6, 44, is that the Father works before we have faith in Christ. So however, however we say it, I mean, it might be crude for me to say that you are given life before you have life. Uh, that's that's uh, complex. It's complicated, most certainly. Well, uh, would, but would, the, would it be less? Would it be less complicated if you understood hell code to mean to enable by bringing the gospel? In other words, by bringing light and truth, he's enabling them to come, but they can't come unless they hear and know. Uh, and listen to the Father, and listen, and are given to the Son. In other words, doesn't it, doesn't it seem to be less complex and less of a problem if you simply understand Helco as to mean to enable versus to effectually cause? I don't deny that uh, the word draws could be rendered enable, uh, because what enable implies is that you were not able before, and now you are able to believe in Christ by right. the effectual work of the Father. Yeah, why do you assume it's effectual? Like, if I give you my phone number, I'm enabling you to call me, but I'm not forcing you to call me. You you can choose to call me or not. By sending you the gospel, giving the gospel to somebody, I'm drawing them to a decision, but to not to decide is to decide. So why 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 do you assume effectuality on the word draw when the word enable doesn't assume effectuality? Um, I'm just wondering where, where you're getting the term effectuality. Is it from the drags, like the sword being drug? Is that is that where you're reading effectuality into the word? Well, it's because of verse 37, where it says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So the drawing is effectual. Whoever is drawn by the Father will believe in Jesus Christ. Um, so those who are given to the Son, is it just an arbitrary choice that God's just picking people and giving them to the Son, or is there a reason that the Father might give someone to the Son? No, God does not do anything arbitrarily. It is all to the praise of his glorious grace, as uh, as Paul had said in Ephesians 1. All Actually, right. Why would he pick one person? Oh, I'm sorry. That's time right there. Thank you so much, guys. All right. We're going to jump into the 15-minute opening for Dr. Layton Flowers. And uh, let me, I'll, I'll sort of fill with you when you go into your opening statement, Dr. Flowers, and then I'll start your time. Yeah. And I'm going to share. I'm a, I'm a visual learner, guys. And so... I uh, have PowerPoints when I do my presentations, and so forgive me. But I do have to confess to Pastor Gabe uh, envy uh, of his voice. Uh, as, <laughs> as Marlon, you mentioned, um, he has a beautiful voice, and I, and I appreciate uh, his taking the time to engage with this. And Marlon, thank you for hosting us. I, I really appreciate that. So let me share this PowerPoint so that you can kind of see where I'm going. Um, this is, as Pastor Gabe actually said, a lot of things I agree with here. Um, I, matter of fact, I don't even have to talk about hermeneutics and exposition because he kind of covered it. I, I just say what he just said, ditto. <laughs> it's the context, which is not only just the chapter, by the way, it is the entire book. It's the entire New Testament. You have to understand context. That is what proper hermeneutics teaches us. And so let's go to chapter one and look at a theme that you see throughout the book of John. He came to his own, which is speaking obviously of Israel, and those who are his own did not receive him. But as many as that did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, those who believe in his name. So you receive so as to be given the right to become a child of God. And we all agree, yes, you're born of God, but who does he birth? Those who believe, those who receive in him. So he came to his own, he came to Israel, and they don't receive him. Now, I think Gabe is right. Why don't they receive him? That, that's a big question. They're not receiving him. Why didn't Israel receive Jesus? Is it because Jesus didn't really love the people of Israel? Maybe he, he didn't really come to die for them, and that's and that's why he did, they're not receiving him? Well, I think we know that's not true. He holds out to his hands to them all day long, longing to gather them like a mother hen gathering her chicks under the wings. We even see in Luke 19, Jesus weeping over Israel, saying, would you, even you, had known on this day the things that were made for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. What does Jesus mean when he says now, 
they are hidden from your eyes. Um, it, it, they weren't hidden before, but now they're hidden. What, what's he talking about when he says these things, Israel, are being hidden from your eyes? Well, he explains a little bit more in John chapter 12, beginning in verse 39. This is a didactic text speaking to the same group of people from Jesus himself, telling us this is the reason Israel could not believe. In other words, he's telling us. We don't have to guess. He tells us. He has blinded. God has blinded Israel's eyes. He has hardened their hearts so that they can neither see with their eyes or understand with their hearts or turn, and I would heal them. So very clearly, he's explaining what many scholars refer to as judicial hardening. All that means is it's an act of a judge. In other words, judicial means that God is the judge, and he gives someone over to their calloused rebellion. In other words, they're rebellious by choice. They, they could have done otherwise. And when they harden themselves, they close their eyes to the word of God, he can strengthen them in their resolve so as to accomplish a good purpose through their rebellion. And so Israel's hardening as a nation was an act of self-hardening, followed by God's act of judicial hardening, as the Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology explains. And so somebody chooses freely to reject and not listen and learn from the Father, and not listen to Moses, and not listen to the Scriptures, then they can become calloused and hardened. They're not born like that. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, it continues on into John chapter 2 as well. He attends the Passover feast. It's an Israelite audience. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them. This continues the same theme that you see in John 3. Many of us know, obviously, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, which, by the way, even John Calvin says this is universally all of mankind. Now, some people try to out-Calvin John Calvin and explain away verse 16, I think, to, uh, to our dismay. Um, because this is an expression of God's love for all the world and his provision for all the world. In verse 20, it continues, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light. So why don't Israel want to come into the light? Because their deeds are evil. They're hardened, depraved sinners, and they don't want to come into the light because then their deeds would be exposed. But the one who practices the truth, those who receive him, they come into the light. So those who listen and learn to, from Moses, those who listen to the Father, they would come into the light. But those who are hardened and rebellious and calloused, they would hide from the light who is Christ. Um, it goes on. We see uh, other parallel passages speaking of this because Jesus isn't entrusting himself to Israel. He's blinding them from understanding that he is the long-awaited Messiah. We see this in Matthew 16, 20, for example, when he warned his disciples they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Uh, Mark 9, 9 even says this. They're coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, don't tell anybody until I'm raised up. Then you can tell everybody. In other words, his strategic purpose is not to reveal himself and his identity until he accomplishes the resurrection. It's when he's raised up that he sends the gospel to go into all the world. But he's not drawing everybody to himself during the time of John chapter 6, especially. Mark 4, he speaks to them in parables. I even heard Pastor Gabe talk about this on one of his programs, and I agreed with exactly what he said. This is parabolic language that Jesus uses, like eat my flesh and drink my blood that we read in John chapter 6. And he's, the reason he's using parables, according to Mark 4 and Matthew 13, is so that they won't believe. It says, lest they turn and I, and I would heal them. In other words, he only speaks to them using parables, but when he's alone with his own disciples, he explains everything to them, which is important to understand the context. In John chapter 4, as Gabe already mentioned, the Samaritan woman at the well is mentioned. And again, the same theme is there. Whoever drinks this living water will have life. Notice the drinking is first. The eating of his flesh, that's first. You will have life. If you do this, then you will have life. If you come to me, you will have life. If you drink the living water, then you will have life. It's always you do this so as to get life. It's never I will give you life arbitrarily or unilaterally just give some people life so that you'll certainly believe. That's never the order of Scripture. In John chapter 5, here, here he's rebuking the Jewish leaders of that day. These are the people he's speaking to in parables to keep them in the dark for a strategic purpose. And he says to them in verse 39, you examine the Scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And this, the very Scriptures that testify about me, Jesus says, and yet you're unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. That's what I was referring to earlier. Notice the order in Jesus's mind. You have to come to me in order to have life. Not I'm going to give you life and regenerate you so that you'll certainly come to me. Verse 46 is, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? What's Jesus saying? If you believed, if you listen and learn from the Father, you would believe me because you would know me. This is why in, in John chapter 10, when he talks about the sheep, he says, you, you don't believe because you're not a sheep. 
Now, the way a Calvinist understands that is to say, well, you don't believe because you're not elect, or I don't really want you. I didn't pick you. No, he's saying, you don't believe in me, the son, because you're not a follower, a sheep of the father. A sheep is a follower. Someone who follows God, who followed Moses, who listened and learned from the father, would hear the son and recognize his voice and would come to him. But if you refuse to follow the father, then guess what you're going to do when you hear the son? You're going to refuse to follow him too, which is the theme throughout the book of John. This brings us to the context of John chapter 6. Here we see an audience of rebellious Jewish people who are seeking to have their bellies filled, who have refused to hear and learn from the Father, and thus they've grown hardened in their rebellion against his truth. They're following their leaders, the Pharisees. Jesus begins to teach them using parables. They can't grasp what he means. They think when he's saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood, he's talking like a cannibal. And Jesus doesn't stop and try to explain it to them. He, he, he doesn't say, hey, guys, don't leave. Let me, let me tell you what I mean. No, he's going to explain it later to his own apostles, but he's not explaining it to them. He is provoking them. He has a mission to accomplish on the cross. And so that's why he's doing this. He's speaking parables in a very hard language that the audience cannot grasp. They cannot understand. Why? Because he's not drawing them to himself yet. It's not until he's raised up, as John 12, 32 says. When, he, when I'm raised up, I will draw all people to myself. It's not until then that he does that. Now we come to John chapter 6, and um, I, I agree with much of what uh, Pastor Gabe actually said in his exposition. And so I'll pick up in verse 32 and really try to focus on our points of contention. Truly, I say to you, it's not Moses who gives you bread out of heaven. It's, in other words, it's not just the manna from the Old Testament. It's my Father who gives you true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life. So you eat the bread in order to get life. And eating bread is obviously symbolic of coming to him or believing in him. And of course, uh, as verse 34 says, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will not be hungry. And the one who believes in me will never be thirsty, which is very similar to what he said to the Samaritan woman as well. But I said to you that you have indeed seen me, yet you do not believe. Now notice this. I want to focus on verse 35. You have seen me, and yet you do not believe in me. It's, it's like Jesus is saying what the, what the prophet Isaiah said. You are ever seeing, but you're never perceiving. Why are they in this condition? I think this is the crux question of this debate. Why is the audience in John chapter 6, the Israelite audience who he came to, who are not receiving him, why are they in that condition? Is it because God rejected them before they were ever born? Is it because God decreed for them to be born as God-haters and that they couldn't have done otherwise because, like the T of Tulip says, they're born in this completely disabled state from birth and they had no control over it? Of course not. That's not what's happening. Paul actually explains to us what's happening in Acts chapter 28. When he says to the rebellious Israelites, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. Notice it doesn't say they were born calloused. They've become calloused. Why? They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see, they might hear, they might understand, they might turn, and I would heal them. He wants to heal them. But because they've closed their eyes, they're now being strengthened in their rebellion. They're being hardened in their rebellion judicially so as to accomplish a good purpose through their rebellion. They're the ones who cry out, crucify me. I crucify him. Give us Barabbas. And he says, therefore, I take the message to the Gentiles, which proves this is not just a universal condition of all men from birth, of being ever seeing, never perceiving. This is specifically about Israel being hardened in their rebellion by a judicial act of God as judgment for them. You have to understand that in order to understand what Jesus is talking about here in John chapter 6. Now, picking up in verse about 43, they're complaining, as Pastor Gabe rightly said, because he says he's from heaven. They say, hey, we know who your parents are. We, we, he's from Nazareth. A prophet is never welcome in his hometown, right? And he says, stop complaining among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Everyone who has what? Heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Sheep will come to me, okay? If you hear and learn from Moses, you'll believe in me because Moses spoke about me. But if you refuse to hear and learn from Moses, you're hardened, you're blinded and you're cut off. I'm speaking to you in parabolic language, and you can't come to me. That's the context. So let's look at the verse in question. No man, udice, which is what Gabe was referring to, is the subject of the entire sentence. Therefore, in my estimation, it's the referent point. So look at this. The hymn, the autan, is referring back to the original word, udice, okay? And so when autan is mentioned, hymn, it's always referring back to the man coming. 
That's why we would say differently than the Calvinist about what this means. But mostly, this is a debate over grammar. And the only way, the best way in the time that we have, limited time we have, to understand the grammar is to give a parallel sentence with the same grammar so to, as to understand the two perspectives. So on our view, it might look like this. No man can come to the son's wedding banquet unless the father invites or enables him. Because the word helco there, the word draws, we would interpret that as inviting or enabling, right? And he, the man who comes, will have a great feast. Now, grammatically, that is perfectly fine. Even grammaticians on both sides of this issue say that's a possible reading of this text. And if that's true, think of the theological implications. Can someone come to the banquet and have a great feast unless they're invited? No. But if they are invited, does that mean they necessarily will come? Well, of course not. The father's invitation, like his drawing, is a necessary condition for the man to come. But that does not mean everyone who is invited will necessarily come. Some will reject the invitation. And whose fault is that? Are they rejecting a God who doesn't really want them? Are they rejecting a God who didn't really send Jesus to die for them? Are they rejecting a God who actually first rejected them? Are they rejecting a loving God who provides everything they need for their salvation, who has no excuse for their rejection of the gospel? So here's the Calvinistic rendering of that same grammatical sentence. No man can come to the son's wedding banquet unless the father compels or drags him. And he, the man who is compelled to come, will have a great feast. So you can see side by side how each of us is interpreting this. So how do you know who's right? Gabe's a great guy, and he sounds like he really knows what he's talking about. So how do you know if Leighton's right or Gabe's right? Look at the theological implications of the whole chapter. Look at the Calvinistic implications of those two interpretations. His audience is unable to come to Jesus, not because of judicial hardening on Gabe's perspective, but because of total inability. Think about that. It's not because they're being hardened in their rebellion that they can't come. It's because of the way they were born, which means that anyone who never comes to faith, anyone who ends up in hell, was born unable to hear and learn from the Father or believe in Jesus for reasons beyond their control. Thus, there's no rational or legitimate basis for which unbelievers can be held blameworthy for their unbelief. It also means God doesn't legitimately desire for all to come to repentance and faith so as to be saved, which flies in the face of many passages of Scripture of God's expressed desire and longing for the salvation of the lost. Finally, it means that someone must have life, as we talked about in the cross-examination, before coming to Christ. And the Bible always tells us that it's by coming to Christ that we get life. Jesus said um, in Colossians uh, 2.12, it says that we're raised through faith, not we're raised unto faith, which is important theologically to understand which of these uh, interpretations is most likely the correct one. So the word helco is a big focus here. And in order for the Calvinists to have any grounds to support their system, they have to prove that the word draw is reference to regeneration and effectual regeneration limited only to the elect. But BDAG, which is the standard for New Testament scholarship, assigns the following definition to Elko, to draw a person in the direction of values for interlife, to draw to attract. In fact, the same word is used in Nehemiah 9.30 in the Septuagint, the Greek translation. And look at the, look at the translation for the word Meshach here. It says, and you have drawn them for many years, but they have not listened. So there you have an example of one being drawn, but they're not listening. The same word, Meshach, is used in Hosea 11, verse 4 and 5. I drew them with cords of kindness, with bands of love, but they have refused to come to me. Thus demonstrating that the word helco is not always used in some effectual way, especially when talking about people. Now, when talking about swords or fish, inanimate objects, yeah, you can use the word draw in a more irresistible kind of manner. But when it comes to talking about people, the Bible uses this word as, 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 as to woo or to invite or to enable, not to effectually cause. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Flowers, for that opening statement. And now we're going back into cross-examination with Dr. With, uh, Pastor Gabe. Gabe, uh, cross-examining Dr. Flowers for five minutes. Yeah. Thank you for uh, uh, for uh, promoting me there. That was that was very kind of you. <laughs> um, Dr. Flowers, do you, would you consider what you just presented there on John 6, would you consider that exposition? Portions of it were exposition, portions of it were arguments against your exposition. 
So the, what you did there, is that the regular discipline that we would apply to any text when we're preaching on that text or trying to help somebody not, understand I'm what not, the text is saying? I'm not, I'm not preaching, I'm debating. Well, certainly, but the, the uh, category at the top, it's there on the top of the screen, what is the expository understanding of John 644? So was that presentation... Okay. Is that I would just say instead of instead of wasting time talking about how I did my presentation, why don't we talk about the arguments that I made in my presentation? We only have a limited amount of time here, and so I, well, I understand that you I don't I, like that. Go ahead. So you would say that was not expository? That's really my question. No, that's not what I would say. Okay. I would say there there is exposition done to come to my conclusion. In a in a in a fifteen okay. minute opener, I'm going to focus on points of contention. I, I did a, br a broader scope exposition of hermeneutics where you look at the entire context by looking at the hardening of Israel, by understanding why his audience, who's his audience? Israelites who are hardened. Understanding that they are judicially hardened is important to understand why he would say what he said to them. In other words, every time you open a, bi a, a, a commentary, Gabe, what do you see at the very beginning? Pages and pages of notes on who's the author, what's happening in the historical context, what's happening in the chapters before and after, all of that's talked about before you get to line by line, verse by verse. I spent a lot of time talking about the line by line, verse by verse, because that's important to understand. So as you can rightly apply what he says in John chapter six, plus I didn't agree. I didn't disagree with a lot of what you, you talked about in your exposition of it. I wanted to focus on our points yes, of contention. Understood. Okay. So the, the comment that you made there is that John six is to Jews. Is that accurate? Well, the audience is Jews, so he's John's talking to audience Jews. Is Jews. The audience You're saying that John's that audience to, is Jews. No, the audience that Jesus is speaking to is a Jewish audience. That doesn't mean it doesn't have application for Gentiles, as I've already mentioned. Obviously, it would have application for us as well. I don't believe anybody can come to the Father unless they are first drawn. Um, I mean, come to the Son unless they are first drawn by the Father. We disagree as to the means by which he draws and the factuality of that drawing. You believe that he effectually draws a pre-selected number. I believe that he draws by means of the gospel, everyone. And so, because that's what John 12, 32 says, when I'm raised up, I will draw all men to myself. And so that's the difference between our interpretation. Everything else you said about John 6, I actually, I just amen. What we disagree with is the your use of the Helco to be effectuality and uh, in regeneration. Okay, well, but you're, I mean, what's, what, with regard to exposition, again, talking about uh, exegesis even, you're saying that John 6 was written to Jews because Jesus was talking to Jews, but John is written by John, and he's writing to his audience about what Jesus was saying to Jews, right? So we're not saying that the audience is Jews. Well, okay, well, Jesus on that is point, then, to a Jewish what, audience. Yes. what is the definition of a parable? A riddle or a... Uh, a story given for the purpose of illustrating a point. Um, okay, yeah, so it, a parable seems, is a story. Yeah. You were saying that Jesus was saying to the Jews here a parable, but this isn't a parable. Or, well, even you in one of your broadcasts, Gabe, if I'm mista not mistaken, you actually, on John 6, you do a broadcast and you refer to Mark 4 and his use of difficult, hard language like you see in parables, things that are difficult to understand. So metaphors. Um, a metaphor is a type of riddle that he they don't understand what eat my flesh and drink my blood is referring to, which refers to coming to Jesus in faith. Um, I think you agree with that as well. According to John 6, who comes to Jesus? According to John 6, 44, who comes to Jesus? Yes. Or are you talking about just in John 6 in, in general? Who, who comes to faith those, in Christ? Those who have heard and learned from the Father, verse 45. So what must happen first is that the Father uh, does a work before anybody can believe, correct? Abs yes, absolutely. So who does not come to Jesus? Those who refuse to hear and learn from the Father. According to John 6, uh, 65, why was it that they did not believe in Christ? Because it was not granted to them to believe in Christ. By whom? All right, All right that's, uh, that's time right there. That's time. All right, so at this time, we will be taking an intermission.
uh, for 60 seconds. So uh, the guys want to stretch a little bit. They can do that. So do what you guys have to do. We'll be right back. All right, guys. Uh, so we are about to head out on the road. The God's truth is, and we are heading to uh, Arkansas uh, for our first live debate. And I am super duper excited, man. This is uh, once again something that I was really hoping that would happen. Uh, something that would come to fruition. Um, I didn't expect it to happen so quickly. And that's the amazing thing is that this happened pretty fast. So, and, you know, and this won't be the, the, the last time that you'll see the God's truth on the road, you know, doing the in-person debates. And so I'm super duper excited about the opportunity to do that. I'll be flying out here February 10th. I'll be flying out and I will be in Arkansas until the 13th. So once again, if you are in town, and you happen to be in the area, uh, come on out, man. I think this is gonna be a joyful time. Uh, once again, Jeremiah Nortier and uh, Brock Kendall is gonna be debating. It's gonna be a, a, a baptism debate. Jeremiah Nortier will be representing the Baptist position, while Brock Kendall will be representing the Church of Christ uh, position on baptism. So it's going to be an exciting time, a great time, and it's going to be happening at Arkansas State University. So make sure you are going, make sure if you can be there. And as I mentioned earlier, this live debate will also be live streamed on the Gospel Truth YouTube page. So if you cannot make it, no biggie, you'll still be able to view it in your, in the, in the, uh, in a convenient way in your home or on your phone or whatever that may be. All right. Uh, so that said, uh, I think the guys may be ready. So we're going to bring these guys back in and we are going to continue to progress through this debate. Uh, let me, you guys are uh, ready to, ready to keep going. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Yes, sir. I think I'm ready. All right, cool. So now we're going to transfer to the rebuttal rounds. Uh, once again, this will be 10 minute rebuttals uh, to start with Dr. Flowers with 10 minute rebuttal. And then we've got five minute cross examination by uh, Pastor Gabe. And then we have a 10 minute rebuttal by Pastor Gabe. And then five minute cross by Dr. Flowers. All right. So that said, uh, Dr. Flowers, you have the stage for your 10 minute rebuttal. I will begin the time when you begin to speak. Well, I was delighted to hear that Pastor Gabe started with quoting the purpose of the book in jo of John um, is verse chapter chapter 20, verse 31, uh, that these things were written so that you may believe and by believing you may have life in his name. Uh, notice the order there. It's by believing that you have life in his name. Yet Pastor Gabe believes that you're regenerated, given new life so as to believe. So the purpose for the very for John writing these things down is to help people to believe which is impossible if Calvinism is true, because everyone's born in a condition where they can't believe even the gospel, unless God unilaterally picked them before they were born and effectually graces them with this work of regeneration. So everybody who's in hell on Calvinism is in hell for reasons completely beyond their control. Absolutely no control of how they were born. And according to Calvinists, they are born with this totally disabled condition where they're unable to even respond to God's life-giving truth, calling them to repentance and faith. And I think that flies in the face of so much of what we learn in Scripture. Um, he also says in verse 29, this is the work of God. And he seems to imply that, that that's referring to the effectual work of God causing people to believe. Again, Gabe likes to out Calvin, even John Calvin. John Calvin wrote this about verse 29. Those who infer from this passage that faith is the gift of God are mistaken. For Christ does not show what God produces in us, but what he wishes and requires from us. In other words, what he's asking there in verse 29, what is the work that God requires? And what Jesus is saying, he doesn't require work of you. He requires that you trust in the work of Christ. That's the work that God requires, trust in Christ. And what Calvinists come along and do, they teach that, well, because you can't do anything good, that means you can't trust in the good one. You can't trust in his works because you can't do anything to earn your way to heaven. Therefore, you can't trust in the one who did it for you. And that's simply a non sequitur. It never is taught that in the pages of scripture. Um, he also just assumes that this is an, uh, I, I would say arbitrary, but maybe that's too polemic. Maybe it's a unilateral decision of God as to why he gives certain people to the son versus understanding that at this time in history, there are people who are God-fearing people 
people like Cornelius who love God, who serve God, people like Lydia, worshipers of God, people like Simeon. These were, these were God-fearing people. And what does the Bible say that God does with those who fear him? Psalm 25, verse 12, who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. So who does God instruct in the way he should choose? Those who fear him, those who heard and learned from the Father. If you listen to Moses and you believe what Moses said, guess what God's going to do with you? He's going to get you and he's going to give you to his son, just like he does with Cornelius. How does he give Cornelius to the son? By sending him a vision and telling him, I want you to hear the gospel. Send for Peter out of Joppa. You've got to hear the gospel. I want to give you to my son because you are a God-fearing man. So he's not just random, seemingly randomly picking people and just giving them to the son for no apparent reason. He's picking people who actually heard and learned from the father, who are actually fearing God. 14 of Psalm 25 says, the secret of the Lord is for those who fear him and he will make him them known his covenant. So who does he make his covenant known to? Those who fear him, the secrets of the Lord. Who does he reveal the secrets to? To those who fear him, to those who listen and learn from his word. In Isaiah 55, verse three, it says, incline your ear to hear, come to me, listen that you may live. What's the order in Isaiah's mind? You listen, you listen and learn from the father so that you might live. Not I'll make you alive so that you'll certainly listen as the Calvinist would in, imply through their reading. Pastor Gabe, so when he talks about giving uh, father giving people to the son, we all agree the father gives people to the son. Of course he gives people to the son, but he has a good reason for it. And it's, it's not a hidden reason in the secret counsels of his will. He states it all the time. I, I save the humble. I, I, I bring low those eyes who are haughty uh, out of Psalm 18, 27. He doesn't hide the reasons why he does what he does when he makes choices. He tells us very plainly why he would give somebody to the son. Um, he also talks about um, boasting and, and, and almost implying that we would have reason to boast if we believe that faith is our responsibility versus something that's effectually caused by God. But the Bible never does this. The Bible says for us to boast in the Lord because we put our trust in the Lord. We are trusting him. So whenever we, fa we have faith, we're not earning or meriting God's salvation by having faith. In other words, it's not by believing in Jesus that we earn salvation, okay? Faith is a filthy rag apart from the atoning work of Christ. For example, when it says in the Old Testament, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. If belief earned or merited salvation, then why would Jesus need to die? God could just say, oh, well, Moses, you, you earn your salvation because you believed. No, he still had a debt to pay that he couldn't pay. He needed atonement. God chooses to impute the righteousness of Christ to those who believe. He doesn't have to do that. He's not obligated to do that. Just like the father in the prodigal son story is not obligated to accept the son back when he comes home. He chooses to do so because he's gracious, not because the son has merited anything from him. If anything, the son deserves to be stoned to death for what he did. The father acts graciously, and it's solely a choice of God as to what he does with people who return home, who ask for forgiveness. And the Bible tells us that if you humble yourself, he will raise you up. He will lift you up. But it's our responsibility to respond. So in John chapter 6, it's important for us to note what's happening. The audience in John chapter 6, which, yes, that is a part of exposition, is understanding who the audience is. The audience in John chapter 6, the narrative that's being recorded for us by John, is a narrative of Jesus speaking to hardened, calloused Israels, Israelites who have grown calloused and rebellious because they shut their eyes. Notice it says the reason they can't believe, according to verse 39 of chapter 12, is because he's hardening them. It doesn't say they can't believe because of what Adam did. It doesn't say they can't believe because God decreed for them to be born in a condition that they can't believe. What's the reason they're in that condition? Because of their unbelief, because they refuse to listen to Moses, they refuse to hear the scriptures, they have grown calloused and hardened, and now Jesus is speaking to them in parables. He's speaking to them with hard and difficult uh, words, which even Pastor Gabe talks about in his own lessons on the what video, 856, I believe it is. And so he's not saying anything that I'm, I'm not saying either in his exposition of this same chapter. And so we have to understand that they think he's being Jesus is being blasphemous here. That's why they're gnashing their teeth at him. That's why they're so upset with him because he says he's from heaven and he sounds like he's teaching cannibalism. And they're upset and they're angry and they're walking away. Now, some people might see that and they go, well, 
doesn't Jesus want them to be saved? Doesn't Jesus want everybody to be saved? You provisionists, don't, don't you Arminians, you provisionists want, believe that Jesus wants them all to be saved? So why is he just letting them walk away like that? Why, why did he say, no, wait, wait, guys, don't no, stop, 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 stop. Let me explain what I mean. It's okay, it's okay. I know that sounds harsh. He doesn't do that. Why? Because it's not until he's raised up that he will draw all men to himself. He is hardening them. He is blinding them in their already rebellious condition so as to bring about the crucifixion through their rebellion, which is exactly why you have in Romans 9 an Israelite saying, why would you blame me? If you're hardening me to bring about the crucifixion and the redemption for the world, then why am I still to be blamed? It's the same interlocutor that we see in Romans chapter 3. Why am I to be blamed? If your righteousness is, bringing, is brought about by my unrighteousness, then why are you blaming me? That is the interlocutor in Paul's mind when we're using uh, talking about Romans 9 through 11. It's the same kind of situation that's playing itself out right here in John 6, where he's blinding Israel in their already calloused unbelief. And that's, that's the reason that they're not able to listen. We have to also understand, uh, just in the last minute that I have here, I'll toggle over uh, just to show this presentation one more time, just to show there's two types of people um, prior to Christ's coming. Okay, there are the God fearing people and there are the hardened ones, right? The God fearing people are those who heard and learned from the Father. They listened to Moses and they actually believed. People like Cornelius or Simeon or people who actually feared the Lord. And there are others who are hardened, the Pharisees of that day. Most of the Israelites of that day are in that condition of being hardened and they refuse to learn because of their self righteousness. So, what would God do for those who are God fearing men and women? Well, like we just read, Psalm 25 tells us exactly what he does for those who fear him. He will instruct them in the way they should choose. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. So who is God going to give to Jesus? Those who fear him, those who believe in him, those who have listened and learned, those who are in rebellion, however, he is going to use them in their rebellion to strategically bring about his plan of redemption. This is why 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 6, 7, and 8 says that these things were hidden from the wise and learned. And had they not been hidden, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. In other words, there's a reason for him hiding it from their eyes. That's why Jesus weeps when we talked about earlier, Jesus weeping over them and saying, now it is being hidden from your eyes. That's what he's talking about. Israel, the truth is being hidden from Israel because he's accomplishing a purpose through them. Well, I'll stop there because I know it's coming to the end of my time. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Flyers, for that rebuttal. All right. Let me pull this. All right. Uh, so now we're going to jump into our cross-examination. Once again, a five-minute cross-examination for Pastor Gabe, and he'll be cross-examining Dr. Flowers. All right, thank you, Dr. Flowers. I, uh, I appreciate the commentary and uh, the questions that you have asked as well. Coming back to John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Uh, can you explain to me again, this was in your opening statement, I will raise him up on the last day. Uh, you said is the subject, no one can come unless the Father sent me, draws him, and I'll raise him up on the last day. But you say that the the one whom he draws is not the one who comes. Was that correct? No, I'm saying the drawing is not necessarily effectual. There's nothing in the sentence itself grammatically or linguistically that necessitates that the drawing here is an effectual drawing. So where does it say that not everybody who the Father draws will come to him? It doesn't say that, but it's not also saying the opposite. My point is, it's you have to, you only can, you can only take what the verse says at face value. What the first face says at face value is that you can't do this. In other words, you don't have the ability to do this, to come unless God does something first. And what does he do first? He enables, he draws, he invites. You can't come to the party unless you have an invitation. How will they believe in one whom they've not heard? Uh, Romans 10, uh, 10, 14. So that he, that that's a necessity. But just because it's a necessity doesn't mean it's effectual. In other words, causing them to come. The I will raise up is assuming that the one drawn will come, not because it's happened by effectuality, but because he's addressing those who come. In other words, the second alton there, the second hymn, is in reference to the original subject, the coming man. And so you can, you can 
you know, use an illustration of, you know, everyone who's recruited in, in the army will be trained. Well, it doesn't mean that everybody who has attempted to be recruited is going to be trained, but what it's saying is assuming that those who are recruited and who come in re response to the recruiting will be well-trained. And in the same way, I think this verse is simply saying that those uh, who come in response to the drawing of God will be raised up in the last day. So how do you understand that according to verse 37? All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. There, the, uh, the question simply being, where do you see that the Father is drawing people who don't come to Christ? Okay, well, I would I would you look at the parable of the Matthew 22 where he invites and calls uh, good and bad alike. He sends the gospel to the good and the bad alike. He goes to Israel first and they would not receive him. So that's examples of fighting, holding out his hands to them all day long, longing to gather them like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but they're unwilling. Um, all of these verses that express his desire and his longing and his, his, his uh, calling to them, those would be expressions of that. But the, the question you were asking about uh, those he's given to the father, um, Cornelius would be a great example of this. He gave Cornelius to the son. He did that through means. I think you and I both agree that God uses means. Well, what's the means that God uses for Cornelius? Well, he sends him a vision and Peter from Joppa to give him to the son. But he's not just unilaterally picking Peter, I mean, uh, Cornelius for no apparent reason. He's picking Cornelius because Cornelius was a God-fearing man. Um, and so that, that's why I'm saying I agree with everything that you said, except I don't just assume that the father's giving people to the son just because of some seemingly random selection before the foundation of the world, because I think that that's bringing other misreadings of passages like Ephesians chapter one into John chapter six and kind of importing the theology of Calvinism into this narrative. And I don't think that's uh, warranted. I'm not bringing any passage out of John six into John six. You're the one that's making references outside of John six to try to explain these things. According to John 6, where do we see an example of God having drawn somebody who does not come to Christ? I don't think that's a burden any of us have. Um, just like you don't have a burden to prove every point of doctrine that you hold to from any one passage. This passage isn't addressing that necessarily. But I don't have a problem saying um, that in order to have life, you must eat of his flesh, right? That's what you so said that in one of your broadcasts. These people here that Jesus is talking to, uh, the Father's not drawing any of them? Well, no, not until he's raised up. Will he draw all men to himself? Okay, he but these, so these the people that Jesus is addressing, he's not, the Father is not drawing them to the Son. No. He do, he's not drawing okay, all so people to that, the Son yet. He, all, is the, 12, the 12 that stayed around, you could say that he's drawing them, but he, he's not correct. drawing all people to himself. I would agree with that. Uh, so doesn't that go against their free will then? No, because remember, it's a judicial hardening, meaning it's an act of a judge because of their rebellion. And we actually believe when they rebel, they rebel freely. In other words, they could have done otherwise. And so people like Cornelius and Simeon and others uh, did listen and learn from the Father. And because they listened and learned from the Father, as you even say in your own broadcast, it's because they listened and learned from the Father that they would come to the Son. I agree with that. It, you, if, if you refuse to listen and learn from the Father, then the Father wouldn't give you to the Son, because if you don't believe Moses and the Old Testament Scriptures, you're not going to believe Jesus either. All right. Thank you guys for that cross-sex. And Gabe, you're up for your 10-minute rebuttal. I'll start your time when you begin to speak. Right. Well, I thank you to Marlon and I thank you for uh, uh, to Dr. Flowers as well. And I appreciate the pushback. It is always good to ask questions about these things. And this is good for you as uh, the viewer as well, so that you can see these differing viewpoints and you can test these things, being good Bereans, opening up the word of God and examining what it is that we actually have according to the text. Unfortunately, what you're hearing from Dr. Flowers, though, is not according to John 6. You hear him bouncing around to all different kinds of places. Even in the questions that I asked him, he can't give me an answer from John 6. He has to go to Matthew or he has to go to Mark. So is this really an honest exposition of what we have of, of this text? Is he really engaging with John 6 in an accurate and an honest way? So we come back again to the beginning of this discourse that Jesus is having with the 
uh, with the Jews who do not believe in him. And I want to uh, kind of highlight a few points here, and then I want to try to address a few other things that Dr. Flowers mentioned. So in verse 26, Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So once again, addressing the people and saying that you don't believe in who I am. And so what Jesus is going to explain to them over the course of this is why they don't believe. And when you get, of course, to verse 44, it's Jesus saying, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So it is to say to those there who do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, that the Father has not drawn them. And Jesus makes the point again in verse 64. There are some of you who do not believe, 65, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Now, don't miss the key point in verse 37 also where Jesus had said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. We do not see in this particular passage, in what Jesus is explaining to these Jews, and what John is recalling for us here, we do not see Jesus calling anyone who who therefore is resisting that particular calling, or that the Father has drawn anyone, that they're going, yeah, well, the Father's drawn me, but I'm not going to believe in Jesus. It is emphatically stated here that all the Father gives to the Son come to him. This is an effectual calling. It is referred to in Calvinistic doctrine as irresistible grace. Now, Dr. Flowers has made some comments about Calvinism. He brought that up before I did, and uh, of course, that's uh, Uh, The gist of his ministry, Soteriology 101, is to be uh, anti-Calvinist. He even brought up John Calvin and said that I am out-Calvining Calvin. Well, I I am not trying to read this according to what John Calvin said. I am trying to read this according to what John actually wrote. And again, that's the test of consistency that I presented at the very beginning. Who is it that is being the most faithful to this text to understand what John said to this audience— And how would John's audience have understood this? Now, Dr. Flowers is trying to say that the audience in John 6 is Jews. Jesus is talking to Jews. But the audience for the Gospel of John is Jews and Gentiles. John is writing to uh, a, a broad audience. He is not writing to one specific group of people. So Jesus is addressing this group, but who is it that is supposed to be learning from what it is that we are reading? It's not just Jews. It is everybody. The reference that uh, Dr. Flowers had made to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Incidentally, the context of that verse goes back to what Jesus had said to Nicodemus in verse 15, where he makes a reference back to the Old Testament, the story in the book of Numbers of the people who were dying because they were being bit by serpents. So Moses put a bronze serpent on a pole and lifted it up, and whoever looked at the bronze serpent would be healed of the snake bite. And so then Jesus explains that God so loved the world he gave his son. So just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that he would draw all men to himself. Whenever we see those statements, beware of the context. Make make a particular point to notice the context. When you see statements like world in the gospel of John, or I will draw all to myself, The context is often with reference to Jews and Gentiles. And when a Jew would have read this, they would have recognized that dichotomy, that it's it's talking about Jews and Gentiles, which is summarized by the word world. So God so loved the world, he loved among Jews and Gentiles, those who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The same thing comes up in John 12, 32 as well, which if I've got time here, I'm going to get to that also. So once again, summarizing in John 6, 44, No one comes to Christ unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And we don't see anywhere in John 6 where the Father is drawing people that can resist the Father's drawing. In fact, again, the statement was made quite clearly in verse 37. All that the Father draws or all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And Jesus clarifying this statement again in verse 65, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. That's the reason why you don't believe. 
In verse 66, which I didn't get to in my opening statement, but we see the conclusion of this discourse that Jesus has with the people. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him except for the 12. Verse 67, so Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. How is it that these 12 have come to believe in Jesus Christ and they did not walk away with the rest of the dozens and possibly even hundreds of disciples that turned away from him when Jesus said these hard things to them? These disciples believe because the Father has drawn them. The Father has given them to Jesus Christ, except the one who is a devil, which Jesus clarifies a little bit later on. And of course, that's in reference to Judas. He is with them for a different reason. But those 11 that are there with Christ, other than Judas, believe because the Father gave them to the Son. And all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and I will never cast out. It's that beautiful, wonderful promise that we have stated over and over again here in John 6, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Now, Dr. Flowers makes a lot of different statements about you know humbling yourself before you come to God and, and things like that, and I totally agree with all of that. I am not in dispute of that at all. When you came to faith in Jesus Christ, as far as you are concerned, you made a decision to follow Jesus. Absolutely. So did I. But when you come to the text and you read the theology of it, you come to find that you could not have even made that decision unless God had acted first. And it is God who changes the heart that when we hear the gospel, we believe what is being proclaimed and, and therefore are saved. The person who hears the gospel and does not believe it, as all of these hundreds of disciples did here, why is it that they did not believe? Jesus explains to them quite plainly in the text that we have in John 6, 64 and 65. Some of you do not believe. Why do you not believe? Because you cannot come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. So we come to find, according to what is said to us in the text, that when we have faith in Jesus Christ, it is because God has done this work in us, and praise be to the glory of God. Now, I want to state that even though uh, Dr. Flowers and I disagree on these points, I believe that Dr. Flowers is a Christian. I believe that he has come to faith in Jesus Christ. I, I, um, I believe that he has come to that faith because the Father has drawn him, whether or not Dr. Flowers has come to understand that from the text. But I put before you, dear Christian, that you test these things for yourself and that you would, as good Bereans, check the text, check what, check what we are seeing, saying and evaluate it according to what we are reading here. And a good honest exposition of John 6, I believe, come, I, I believe comes to this conclusion. What is stated plainly in John 6.44, without any acrobatics or gymnastics, that anyone who comes to Christ has come to Christ because the Father so graciously and lovingly drew us to him. It was not by our work, and I have never said that it was by our work that we come to God. It is his work that he does in us to effectually change our hearts as being one who uh, previously, we were in rebellion against God. Previously, we wanted to go our own way. Instead, we have come to faith in Christ. We have humbled ourselves and come to the Lord. And this humility has happened because the Father has drawn us. The Father has taught us, as said in verse 45, all who has learned from the Father will come to me. The Father is the one who shows us and reveals to us that we have sinned and that Jesus is the Savior who cleanses us of our sins and all of these things by what is proclaimed to us in the Word of God. Uh, Romans ten seventeen, a passage that Dr. Flowers had mentioned before, that, uh, that we come to faith in Christ because we heard the Word. Uh, that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But it is the Father who works in the heart of a person to understand what is being said. Even these hard sayings that Jesus is saying to the Jews here in John 6, they only understand them because the Father has drawn them. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for that rebuttal. All right. We're going to jump back into cross-examination. And Dr. Flowers, you have five minutes to cross examination Pastor Gay Rehus. Did you agree or disagree with my commentary with regard to judicial hardening of Israel, that Israel was being blinded or given over uh, in rebellion 
um, using parabolic language. Uh, did you disagree with that aspect of what I said? I'm confused by it uh, because you are you are talking uh, or, or attempting to explain that a person has a decision or they can freely make a decision to follow Jesus. But as you make this statement about judicial hardening, I mean, that to me sounds like you're saying that they don't have the free will, therefore, to make a decision to follow Jesus. Right. Well, they don't have the freedom to follow Jesus if they haven't listened and learned from the Father, because the Father wouldn't be giving them to the Son unless they did listen and learn from the Father. And, and I can understand the confusion. Sometimes thinking from a different worldview can be difficult. But I'm just asking if you agree that it's, it's clear that Jesus is using difficult, hard language and that he's doing it purposefully in John chapter 6. In other words, he's not trying to get people to follow him in John chapter 6. I agree with you that he's using difficult language there, right, that they don't understand. But my clarification you, would be that they don't believe because the Father has not drawn them. Okay. So in John chapter 12, where it says, when I'm raised up, in other words, when he ascends into heaven, the last thing he does is send the gospel to call all people to himself. Um, do you believe that that drawing is only in reference to some of all kinds of people? Or would you say that the drawing in John chapter 12 is, is universal? I would say that the gospel must be proclaimed to all people, absolutely everybody, and there's no one from whom we should withhold the gospel. But the statement that Jesus makes there in John 12, 32, with reference to uh, drawing all men to myself, uh, as I said in my rebuttal, pay very close attention to the context there. Because this is right after a bunch of Gentiles had come to Philip and said, I want to, hey, we want to talk to Jesus. And it's after that happens that Jesus says that the Son of Man will be lifted up and will draw all men to himself. So that's in reference to Jews and Gentiles. In episode 856, you said this, quote, Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father, who has known the Father according to the Old Testament scriptures, will come to me, end quote. So do you believe that the Old Testament saints like Moses or the Old Testament saints, that they had to be regenerated in order to hear and learn from the scriptures of old? They did not know God unless God had revealed it to them in their hearts, correct? And so is that regeneration as well? Is that a Helco drawing for the Old Testament saints as well? Yeah, the reason why anybody believes in God is because God has first done the work on a person's heart. Okay, but I'm asking about the Old Testament. In the Old Testament scriptures, those who heard and learned from the Father came to Jesus. Where does it say that the Old Testament Christians had to be regenerated in order to hear and learn from the Father? That's out of the context of John 6. John 6 is not explaining no. that to us. John 6, I, actually, verse I, 45 I says I that. The question. I understand the question, but it's not according to John 6. Jesus is explaining to them why they don't come to him. And the reason why they don't come to Jesus, who is there, right there in their presence, is because the Father has not drawn them. I, I fully acknowledge that even in the Old Testament, one did not believe in God unless God had done that work in their hearts. But as we're talking about faith specifically in Jesus Christ, that's the context of John 6. Jesus is saying the reason why you don't believe in me is because it's not been granted to you by the Father. Okay, so... The Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified, according to Acts 7.39. So Old Testament saints didn't have the Spirit of God, uh, even people who believed in Jesus prior to receiving the Holy Spirit. How did they do that um, without the Holy Spirit? I, I don't really understand what that has to do with John 6. That's, that is a well, different context. Again, We're talking here about Jesus saying, the reason why you don't believe in me is because the Father has not drawn you. Okay, but the reason they don't believe, according to Jesus in chapter 12, is because he's hardening them. So Jesus actually tells them why they can't believe, and we agree that he's not drawing them. We've already established that. It seems like you're not arguing our point of contention. Maybe you don't understand our point of contention. Our point of contention is not whether Jesus has, God has to draw us or not. We all agree he has to draw us. And we all agree, at least I think we should agree, that he's not drawing everybody in John chapter 6. And so I'm, I'm trying to understand whether you're following our line of argumentation, because much of your rebuttal didn't hit on the points that I was raising up with regard to judicial hardening and the fact that he's not drawing people in John chapter 6 to himself. He's actually uh, 
repulsing to them and, and being repulsive to them for a purpose. And I'm wondering if you're following that argument and understand where I'm coming from. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. That Jesus is speaking what he is saying to these Jews here, uh, that they would not believe in him. Uh, the question that I had asked you earlier was, uh, were these people being drawn to him? And, uh, and of course, you agree that they are not. Correct. And so, uh, so understanding that they're not being drawn by, to, by right now, but that they could be being drawn later once he accomplishes Calvary, doesn't that help us to understand the possible intention of the author here? Instead of applying this to a universal soteriology of all people, understanding that he's speaking to a Jewish audience about their condition of being hardened in their rebellious condition so as to bring about the crucifixion. Don't you think that's important to understand the context? Marlon, were you going to allow me to answer that question? I thought I heard you jump in there. No, no, I didn't. Go ahead and answer this question. This will be the final response to Dr. Layton Flowers' okay. question. Do you mind if I ask Layton to repeat that one more time? Yeah, go ahead. I apologize. I heard the ding in my ear and it kind of threw it's me all right. off. We can, we can move on. No. Okay. It, it's fine. We can, we can move that. on. Okay. Yeah, all that, right, was, no problem. that was me. I was easily distracted there. <laughs> it's all right. It happens, man. Good stuff, guys. I'm enjoying the conversation. I know the live chat is also enjoying the conversation. So I appreciate you guys, the quorum, and able to converse about this serious subject without any hostility. Uh, as, a, as you guys know, debates can get fiery, but I do appreciate you guys being calm and collected throughout this discussion. Now, that said, we're going to take another 60-minute uh, intermission. Uh, it's a lot of guys to sort of gather their thoughts once again before, before closings. And uh, so, you guys, stretch your legs again, man, and we'll be right back. All right, another, uh, not another, not done yet, but uh, the debate is going great. And I thank you guys, everyone in the live chat. I thank you guys for uh, for joining us tonight. And we have a super chat here. And uh, <laughs> my moderators don't play, man. I'm just letting you guys know. They don't play games, man. They, they try to keep an a orderly live chat. So I'm sorry. I thank you for the super chat, man. Thank you for the, the support, Robin. I appreciate the support of the ministry. But, man, they don't play. Thank you, man. So uh, if you get a little spicy in the live chat, they will put you on time out. I haven't seen anybody get kicked, totally kicked out yet. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen. But for the most part, I think everyone has been doing great. I've been sort of looking at the live chat and while also listening to the debate. So and uh, doing all the little special effects and all the stuff I do in the back in the background. Um, but uh, that, you guys are great. And I just want to appreciate you. Thank you. appreciate you guys for doing that. Um, if you guys don't remember, uh, we have a, a lot of shows coming up here. Let me uh, remove this. Um, this thing right here, but we do have a lot of shows that are coming up here in the future. And uh, I want you guys to be aware of them. So once again, uh, we do have our Unitarians considered Christians. That's going to be Kelly Powers versus Andrew Griffin. And then after that, we have a two on two debate. Uh, Francis Turlton, Dan Chapa versus Sam Shimon and William Arbridge. Perpetual virginity debate was Mary Ever Virgin. So that's going to be a great one. And then, once again, as I mentioned in our first intermission, will be uh, the God's Truth First live in-person debate. So this is going to be great, and I'm excited for this one. And then I have Dr. Gary DeMar versus Dr. Michael Brown. Has Matthew 24 been fully fulfilled? So a bunch of great shows that are coming up, and I am continuously trying to book these debates, get people on. So just make sure you're on the lookout for them all, all right? Uh, that's it. I'm going to bring guys in and we're going to jump into closings. So, uh, audience, this is closings. After this, we're going to have a 30 minute Q&A. So make sure if you have a question, get it in. All right. And once again, Super Chats get priority. So make sure you get those questions in if you want to get a question asked by the answer by these guys. All right. Uh, that said, uh, I believe Pastor Gabe, you are up first for your closing. So I'll start your time as soon as you begin to speak. All right. Thank you so much, Marlon. And again, to Dr. Flowers, it was a, a pleasure to meet you uh, through the course of this debate. And I'm sure that we will continue sparring with one another, even online after this is over. <laughs> uh, this is always a blessing to be able to open the word of God and read it. And I hope that you feel the same. It has been a blessing of God on my life that I get to be a pastor. What a wonderful thing to uh, be entrusted with the oracles of God, what we have in the scriptures, and to teach this to the people of God, 
not just proclaim these things so that people will be saved. That's what we do through evangelism. But through a careful and systematic teaching of the Word of God, we are sanctified by these things. We are grown in holiness and Christ-likeness. For as Jesus will say later on in John in his high priestly prayer, John 17, 17, he says, Father, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. So we are grown in holiness and our understanding of God by these things that we are considering. Now, what I want to do with this conclusion here is I want to uh, reiterate some of the things that we've been considering from John chapter 6 once again, which I'll do at the very conclusion. But first, I want to address a few other passages that uh, Dr. Flowers has mentioned. One of the questions that he asked of me, and I will admit that I got kind of hung up on the question, was with regards to life. So when we talk about regeneration, he said, so does God bring you to life before you have everlasting life? Because it is only by faith in Jesus Christ that we have everlasting life. And yes, that's the case. My explanation for that was that the things that happened there regarding regeneration and faith, we put that in a specific order. The heart must be regenerated before the person can believe. And I believe that's what's being argued there even in John 6, 44. That's in agreement with what Jesus said in that particular passage. But don't think of the life that happens to the heart that a person may believe as being the same as the eternal life that we are given in Jesus Christ. Before we come to Jesus, we have dead hearts. I mean, we're dead in our spirits. We are physically alive, but we are spiritually dead and incapable of believing in Christ, except that we are brought to life. Our dead spirits are given life that we may hear the gospel and believe it. And then it is only uh, in, in that regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, which is mysterious. I mean, it's even difficult to find good language to explain it. But it is in that regenerating work that the Spirit does in our hearts, bringing us to life, that we may have ears to hear. Our ears that had previously been stopped up, or hardened even, as Dr. Flowers had explained. We are able to hear because of, uh, of, what the work, uh, because of the work of God, because what He has done. We come to faith because... God first acts. And even when we look in John 3, when Jesus explains being born again to Nicodemus, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So we're born again and then given the gift of everlasting life. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Just like the Jews in John 6, uh, Nicodemus is hearing with his flesh. He is not understanding according to the Spirit of God. And Jesus says in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So there is a work of the Spirit that is done first before one becomes a citizen of the kingdom of God. Jesus says that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is is spirit. So being born again and being given spiritual ears that we may understand spiritual things, then we are able to hear these things from God and know that Jesus is truly the Christ. Now that's in John 3. Let's go to John 12. So again, if you've got your Bible open in front of you as you've been following along with us, let's look at John 12 where Jesus makes this statement about being uh, lifted up from the earth, and I will draw all people to myself. Let me start in verse 20. So in John 12, 20, now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. This, of course, is happening into uh, is happening in Jerusalem. And another word for Greeks is Gentile. So these came to Philip because he had a Greek name. So they go to one of the disciples of Jesus that has the Greek name, and they say to him, um, I'm sorry, I got lost there for a moment. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now we come to understand here, according to the course of things that we have read in succession in John, that a person who serves Christ, a person who comes to him, who believes in him, believes because the Father 
has done this work. The Father has drawn the person to Christ and will therefore follow him and serve him. Verse 27, Now is my soul troubled, Jesus says, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The voice of the Father. Then verse 29, the crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Again, they're hearing with their flesh. They cannot even hear with their spirit. They cannot even hear the voice that comes from heaven and claim that that came from God because the Father has not drawn them. Others said an angel has spoken to him. In verse 30, Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And we understand this drawing according to what John had written previously in John 6. It is not, uh, it is not the drawing that um, uh, Dr. Flower said came from the book of Nehemiah or the way that word is used in the book of Hosea. It is what John is saying in the context of his gospel. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And again, as I said earlier, a, a Jew especially would recognize the dichotomy that's going on here of Jesus talking about Jew and Gentile all to myself. Now, in the original Greek, there's not people, there's not men there. We've kind of added those words. It's just simply, I will draw all to myself. But all who come to Christ have been drawn by whom? They have been drawn from the Father. This can't be talking about every single person on earth because every single person on earth does not hear the gospel. Dr. Flowers mentioned being a Southern Baptist, and so I know that he has seen those International Missions Board uh, uh, posters that get sent out all the time showing us the different groups in the world who are unreached people groups. There has been no gospel that has been delivered to them at any time. They have never even heard the gospel before. So this is not a reference to Jesus saying every single person on the planet alive is going to hear about the gospel, and so therefore through this I'm going to draw all people to myself. It is just simply saying that all kinds of people, Jews and Gentiles, will come to Christ. He will, be, uh, he will be saving people from both people groups. I'm about eight minutes here. i got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to uh, address one other matter, and this was in Colossians 2.12. This was uh, another reference that um, Dr. Flowers had made, and this goes back to the statement about being given life before having eternal life. So in Colossians 2.12, I'm going to start reading in verse 11. Paul says here, "...in him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands." By, um, uh, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. Now, uh, Dr. Flowers is saying that through faith, the faith is in the powerful working of God, and then that person is therefore raised. But there are some translations that actually render this verse, you were also raised with him through faith, by the powerful working of God. So what is being st st stated here actually is that a person comes to faith and believes because that is the powerful working of God. And that's consistent with what we have read here in John chapter 6. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent, as Jesus said in John six twenty nine. And once again, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Verse 44, once again, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. We have come to knowledge of our sin. We have come to knowledge of who Jesus is. Jesus has even shown to us the Father. We have come to these things because God has worked in our hearts that we may have faith and believe. It is not by our work. Again, going back to the beginning of the, uh, of the Gospel of John, which I read and Dr. Flowers had quoted as well. John 1, 12, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. As we had uh, both stated from John chapter 20, the reason for this gospel is that you would know that Jesus is the Christ, and so put faith in his name and be saved. And we have been saved by the gracious working of the Father. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this debate. All right. Thank you, Pastor Gabe, for that closing.
All right, Dr. Flowers, you're up for your 10 minute closing. I'll start your time when you begin to speak. All right, I do want to also thank Pastor Gabe and uh, Marcus. This has been fun. I enjoy these kinds of things. All of our theology geek friends out there uh, enjoying this dialogue, and um, I appreciate it. Um, and I, I want to first reference the fact that I'm hearing some background noise. I'm not sure if you can help with that. Thanks. Um, is everything okay? Yeah, everything's fine, Leighton. You got it. Okay, yeah, all right. Um, I, Pastor Gabe seemed to have some problem with me using cross-references. Uh, cross-referencing is done in every major exposition. Um, understanding the historical context of Israel's hardening is a part of every exposition. And he seems to think that that's discounted because it's not uh, line by line in a particular passage. He also uses the argument from silence that because in John chapter 6, I can't find people who are drawn who refuse coming, uh, as if I don't believe people have to be drawn in order to come. Again, that's not even our point of contention. Um, it, it's an argument from silence because I did reference other passages. Like in my nine thirty, that uses the same Greek word helco. In fact, not, not many other passages. God drawing or God calling or God holding out. Longing for, or, or all these kinds of examples throughout Scripture, and just to say we have to limit ourselves to a particular chapter is not good biblical exposition. My hermeneutics teacher taught me: you allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. John chapter six verse forty four is one of the most highly debated verses in all of Scripture, back from even John Chrysostom saying that the Manichaeans leap on this text to prove that we have no power. This has been debated from the beginning of church history. For us not to reference other scriptures that are more clear would be bad exegesis and bad exposition. And so I think we have to reference other things. He seems to also misunderstand the audience issue. Just because something is written to somebody doesn't mean it can't be for somebody else. The, the past, Jesus might be speaking to Peter after he denies him three times, for example. That doesn't mean it can't be for me if I have found myself in a place where I've denied Christ through my actions or my words. So just because we're understanding who he's talking to and the condition they're in doesn't mean that the verse isn't for me. Just like we learn when, when the Bible says over and over again, don't harden your hearts like the people did in Israel. In other words, we need to learn from what Israel did. We Gentiles need to learn not to do what the Jews did in the wilderness, hardening our hearts because he will cut us off too if we harden our hearts like the Israelites did. And so there's warning for us absolutely as Gentiles, and this text is for us. But just because it's for us doesn't mean it was written to us. And therefore, we don't need to understand that universally everybody's born in this condition where they are ever seeing and ever perceiving, hardened by God judicially, because that's not the context of the New Testament. The Bible warns us not to become hardened and close our eyes so that we become ever seeing and ever perceiving. Calvinists just assume you're born ever seeing and ever perceiving. He actually references this as a being dead, spiritual deadness. This is what Calvinists do. They have focused upon this dead idiom of scripture, and they have hyper-focused on it to the point to mean, okay, that means you're unable to respond even to God's life-giving truth. This just doesn't bear itself out. It's like the prodigal son was once lost, but now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive, according to Jesus. Doesn't mean he can't come home, because obviously he did come home. It means he was lost. He was in a far country. So dead is talking about being separated from God because of your immorality, because of your uh, sin. And the Bible even teaches in, in Romans chapter six that we as Christians are to be dead to sin. Now, I wish that meant I could not sin anymore, but it doesn't because dead doesn't mean inability. He says to the church in Sardis, you, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up and renew what remains. No commentator takes that word dead to mean inability to respond to God because that's not what the idiomatic use of the word dead is entailing. You're dead, but you're still able to suppress truth. You're still able to trade truth in for lies. What corpse has traded truth in for lies? You can't, a corpse can't do that. It's talking about a living, sinuous being who is separated uh, by his rebellion from his father and needs to draw near. To be made alive is to draw near, to be back in reconciliation with God. And so they hyper-literalize this deadness to mean you're incapable of responding even to God's life-giving truth. He also talks about in John chapter 3 there about being born again. It, notice it says you have to be born again in order to see the kingdom of heaven. And then he's interpreting that to be, you have to be born again in order to believe in Jesus. 
The, the Bible doesn't say you have to be born again in order to believe in Jesus. It says you have to be born again in order to see the kingdom of heaven. So you believe in Jesus, you come to Jesus so as to be born again, so as to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's the basic order there. Um, there's several uh, issues that he, he, he also brought up with regard to um, the serpent lifted in the desert. He also pulled that in. Uh, and, and I think that's a great reference out of John chapter three um, that I'm glad he brought up because it really gives us an example of provisional atonement. The serpent was lifted up for the whole group, the Israelites, just as Christ is lifted up for the whole world. OK, but who does it benefit? It benefits those who look to the serpent in faith. So if a snake bitten Israelite didn't look to the serpent, then he would not have been healed. It only benefits those who look in faith to the provision. In the same way, Christ was lifted up for the world, but only those who look to the provision in faith will actually be healed. There's also a quote here. I'm going to put this up on the screen if you don't mind. This is a quote from Pastor Gabe in uh, episode 856. He says this, quote, If the Jews had been listening to the Old Testament scriptures, if they had been listening to Moses and the prophets, then they would know who Jesus is, and they would come to him because they would have known the Father of God. I love that he said that because it's exactly my exposition of this passage. If they learned from Moses, if they learned from the Father, then they would have come to the Son. So what's the opposite of that then? If they don't listen and learn from the Father, then they won't come to the Son. That's the basic meaning. And so the reason they can't come to the Son is because they're not listening to the Father, and the Father's not going to give them to the Son if they're not believing, if they're not a sheep, if they're not following his voice. So in other words, God's not just arbitrarily or unilaterally or just unconditionally picking people and bringing them to new life or picking people and giving them to the son for reasons that we just don't know. And you just hope you're part of the ones that were chosen that gives, gets given to the son. No, he's giving those who trust in him, who believe in him to the son. He's giving those who humble themselves and trust in him to the son. So he has a good reason for doing what he does. Um, and so it seems that we both agree that if they had heard and learned from the Father, they would have come to the Son. But look, at, therefore, what is our theological difference side by side? It's right there on the screen. It's very easy to see. On provisionism, everyone is born responsible for what they hear from the Father through both general revelation and special revelation, by the way. That's how I would answer his question about those who are unevangelized. Because there is no excuse, God has written the law in all people's heart. And through general revelation, everyone is responsible for what they know about God. Therefore, anyone and everyone can respond to the light and revelation they've been given. And God is faithful to bring more light, more revelation to those who are faithful with a little. So on our side, we say everyone's born responsible for what they hear from the Father, whether through general revelation or special revelation. And they are able to respond, in other words, to his drawing by either suppressing that truth or accepting it. God draws all people. No one has an excuse. God draws everyone. But on Calvinism, the opposite is true. Everyone is born unable because of the T of total inability. They're born unable to spiritually hear because they're dead, corpse-like dead, in, in the Calvinistic reading, as Gabe was explaining. And they can't hear and learn from the Father because of a condition they're born with. And, and unless God unconditionally elected them before they were ever born, and he effectually graces them, they have no hope. They're born basically a victim of God's decree. God either decreed them to be reprobate or to be elect, and they have absolutely no control over it. There's no basis to blame them. In other words, on Calvinism, God does not draw all people to the to 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 uh, to the Son. But yet we see from John 12, 32, which I'm glad he took some time to, to explain that, uh, because it, it seems to be the basic reading of the text here, without doing any gymnastics, as he <laughs> referred to it, is to say, if I'm lifted up, in other words, when I ascend to heaven, what's the last thing that Jesus does before he ascends into heaven? He commissions the gospel to go be preached to every creature thus drawing all people to himself. Not only through the word, but through the light of general revelation, God's light is made known to all men. His light, which comes to all, the scripture says. Have they not heard? Have they not seen Romans chapter 11, 10? He says, yes, they have. In other words, everyone has a sufficient light in order to believe the light they've been given. And if they refuse to believe, that's their fault, not God's. I don't blame it on God for people's inability. And ultimately, the sovereign decree on Calvinism is what blames God for the way people are born. And I don't think that that's uh, a correct reading. This is parallel to what we were talking about in Mark 9, 9. When they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, he, he orders them not to tell anybody what they had seen. And he told them, wait until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. What's he saying? 
You can tell people because that's the means by which you can convince them I am who I said I am. Um, you can tell them about the resurrection. You can tell them about the gospel, but not until I have risen from the dead. So in other words, God is not drawing all men to himself until he accomplishes Calvary. And that's what you have to understand historically in order to understand the meaning of the text in places like John chapter 6, where he's talking about the drawing of the Father to the Son. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you so much, guys, for that awesome, awesome debate. You guys did great. Excellent job. I wish I had, I got all my little sound effects. I got my little sound effect board here, but I don't have a hand clap or, or a cheer sound effect. Perhaps I should invest in putting that on my soundboard. But nonetheless, great job, guys. You guys did great. And obviously, we appreciate the uh, interaction you guys gave. And so now we're going to jump into Q&A. And so we're gonna let the audience get involved as well. And we do have some super chats here. And the first question is for Dr. Flowers. What is grace? Uh, does God have to grant what he commands or can man obey God's call of the gospel out of the man's own free will? Thank you for the super chat, Dr. Bob. Well, I do believe men are responsible, meaning they are able to respond to the call of God because it's from God. In other words, I don't think God would send an insufficient call. Um, now, the Calvinist believes that it has to be a effectual call in order for God to get all the credit. But since when does a gift have to be effectually given for the giver to get all the credit for giving it? So we all agree, you can't come unless he draws. You can't come unless he helps you. You have to have his help. But just because he helps or he, he help, uh, you know, draws you doesn't mean you necessarily will come. That's why you're to blame when you resist the Holy Spirit. And to ask what is grace, it's unmerited favor. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't owe grace to us. He doesn't even owe grace to those who have faith. It, when Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness, God didn't owe that to him. He didn't have to give him uh, in the imputed righteousness of Christ. He didn't have to send Jesus to die for those who have faith. He, he chooses to do so because he's a good God, not because faith earns or merits anything. All right. Uh, Pastor Gate. Yeah, I would uh, agree with Dr. Flowers wholeheartedly that every person is responsible for their own actions. Uh, a person is going to be held accountable before God, uh, and I would never say anything otherwise. Romans 14, 12 says each of us will give an account of himself before God. Nobody's going to be able to stand before God and say that, uh, well, you made me this way. Uh, that's the, re the argument that's responded to in Romans 9. Well, what is made say to its, uh, say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Uh, but it is it is God who acts sovereignly, and uh, and every person yet at the same time is going to be held accountable for their own actions. With regards to the question, what is grace? I agree with Dr. Flowers. It is unmerited favor. Uh, I've also heard this definition, and I think that this applies as well. Not to say that that definition is wrong, but grace is also demerited favor in the sense that what we deserve is the judgment of God, and everybody deserves that, but it is God who is gracious toward us and has given us his son that whoever believes on his name may have everlasting life. Amen. All right. Well All right. And we have another super chat here. And once again, it's for you, Dr. Questions for you, Dr. Flowers. Dr. Flowers, can a man who is judicially hardened obey the free call of the gospel? If not, what distinguishes him from the one who is not hardened? Well, that's the difference between us and the Calvinist is that somebody can become hardened over time because of their eyes being closed or not born in the already kind of essentially hardened condition. And so uh, if somebody is self-hardened, they can be provoked to envy like uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 14 talks about. They can be provoked by circumstances. They can be provoked by the word of God. It's one of the reasons we say he spoke in parabolic language. So as to lest they see, hear, understand, and turn. And so uh, he seemed to be believing that uh, the parables were helping to prevent them from coming to faith because he seemed to believe that speaking the plain truth could have convinced at least some of them to come to faith. And that wasn't the purpose yet. He wanted to accomplish his purpose on the cross. In other words, he wasn't drawing all men to himself until he accomplished Calvary. Uh, so that's I, hopefully answers the question. All right, Pastor Gate. Uh, I, I agree with the concept of judicial hardening. So uh, Dr. Flowers had asked me that question earlier, and just to clarify, yeah, I do believe that God will judicially harden a heart, 
but it, it's always interesting to hear somebody who is more on the free will side of things use that expression because for a person to be judicially hardened, their free will is taken away. They can now no longer make any decision to follow God because they have been judicially hardened against God. Uh, and yet uh, we, uh, we understand that, according to what we've talked about tonight in John 6, 44, that it is uh, the Father who affects in a person's heart a desire to believe in Christ and therefore believes in him. And whoever uh, the Father gives to the Son, the Son will not turn away. All right. And here's another super chat. And this question is for you, Gabe. The God is a question for Gabe in your opener. All you did was read John six and then add a few of your personal comments. Simply reading is not, is not eisegesis or exp exposition. So why do you think you did and Leighton didn't? Uh, well, I just have to disagree that what I did was not exposition. Uh, I was uh, very, um, uh, particular to the text because we have to see these passages in context. And I don't think Dr. Flowers did that. I don't think that he presented John 6, 44 in the proper context, even jumping all the way to John 12 and reading that back into John 6. And I, I do not deny the discipline of cross-referencing. I do it all the time. Dr. Flowers, uh, so gracious to have listened to a lot of my podcasts, and I thank him for doing that. So he heard me make numerous cross-references there as well. A cross-reference can help us shed light on what a particular passage means, but it is not the grid work that we use to understand the plain meaning of that text and then take, because otherwise we're taking cross-references and forcing the text through that grid work, and that's, that may not be what John had intended there unless we read it in the proper context. Matthew and Mark are writing to a different audience than John is, is writing to. And so therefore we must understand even their passages in context in order to rightly use them as cross-references according to what John says. Well, Dr. what's interesting Flowers? to me is that, uh, what's interesting to me is that even the, some of the same cross-references that I used are the same ones that Gabe uses in his own broadcasts. When he was doing exposition of John 6, he actually refers to Mark 4 and the parables. And he actually links that to the the um parable the, the the language of eating the flesh and drinking the blood and i was going oh good we're not gonna even have to disagree over that because he does the same thing when you reference other texts you're supporting your findings in the context of the passage you're, you're in question so for example when i say what does helco mean um and then i reference nehemiah 9 30 where helco is used what am i doing i'm allowing scripture to interpret scripture by showing here's an example of where helco is used that doesn't reference to a, an effectual calling of god's people and that's, that's supporting my findings of the text in question. You're the one who has the burden, in, in my opinion, you have the burden on your side to show that Helco has to mean uh, effectuality. Not just that it could mean it, because I can even agree that it could mean it, but if I can just demonstrate that it might be the kind of Helco being used in Nehemiah 930 or in uh, John 12, 32, then I have demonstrated, I think, that my reading is a more likely reading given the implications of the Calvinistic interpretation versus my, the implications of my interpretation. All right. And here's another super chat. And this question is for you again, Gabe. Um, I meant exegesis, not eisegesis in my previous question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Aaron, we, uh, we figured that you meant <laughs> exegesis. Anyway, in my previous question to Gabe, one more question for Gabe. How can you logically have life before you're justified? We're justified by faith, not before. How can you logically have life? Well, once again, conflating the, the concept there, we use the word life as an expression of regeneration is different than the holy life that we are supposed to have in Christ, the sanctified life. It's different than uh, the eternal life that we are given in Christ. These are different applications of the word life. Uh, it, is not, uh, it is not to mean that one who has uh, a soul that has been given life so can therefore hear the gospel and understand it and believe it is not the same as the eternal life that has been given to us by faith in Christ. All right, Dr. Flowers. Well, Titus 3, 5 says that we, uh, not by works or righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. So if uh, it's the washing of regeneration, and that's the one of the only references to the word regeneration in the New Testament, in fact, and it's a washing of regeneration, it would seem to me that 
that Gabe and other Calvinists would say that you have to be washed before you can even confess that you're dirty. Uh, you have to have the washing of regeneration before you can even confess that you're a sinner. Um, at least that use of the word regeneration. So the burden is on the Calvinists. Demonstrate for me why you think helco means regeneration. Why does drawing mean regeneration? That's your burden to demonstrate that drawing is in reference to regeneration. That's not my burden. That's that's the Calvinist burden. And and I don't I never saw in this debate or any other where a Calvinist has demonstrated, at least convincingly to me, that the drawing being referenced is to the washing of regeneration as referenced in Titus three five. All right. And here's a question for Gabe. Why does God draw some and not others in John 6? I don't know. And we don't get to know that. That is, that is God's decree. That is what he has decided. Uh, what we know and what I had stated from Romans 14 is that we're all responsible for our own actions. We're all going to have to stand before God and give an account. So you are responsible to hear the gospel and to turn from your sin to the Lord Jesus Christ and live. Everyone who hears the gospel has a responsibility to believe in what it is that has been said. Uh, and it is not going to be upon every per uh, upon any person to stand before God on that day of judgment and say, "Well, the reason why I don't believe is your fault." Uh, that was actually a that was a, an answer that Adam gave. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter three. And when God asks Adam, did you eat the fruit that I told you not to eat from? Adam's response is, the woman you gave to me gave me some of the fruit and I ate. So this concept of blaming God even goes back to uh, the first sin. But as is said in Romans chapter 9, well, what is made? Say to the maker, why have you made me like this? Uh, nobody will be able to blame God. Uh, it is God who decides. Why does he draw some and not others? We'll know that in eternity. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now we see as though through a glass darkly, but soon we'll see face to face, and then we will know just as we are fully known. All right, Dr. Flowers. Well, I, I think Pastor Gabe gave us an answer in episode 856 when he said, if the Jews had been listening to the Old Testament scriptures, if they had been listening to Moses and the prophets, then they would know who Jesus is and they would have come to him. In other words, the Father would have given them to the Son. But because they didn't hear and learn, they did not come to Christ. That's what verse 45 says. If you, he, he presents it to all, and those who listen and learn will come to Christ. And so the opposite must also be true. Those who don't listen and learn won't come to Christ. And so the answer is implicit within that text and explicit in other texts that we referenced already in our opener with regard to the hardening of Israel. Why do they not believe? John chapter 12, verse 39. This is why Israel could not believe. And then he quotes from Isaiah, where they are hardened, they are blinded, they're ever seeing and ever perceiving as a judgment on them for their rebellion, not just arbitrarily as a thing from birth that they can't help. In other words, this is a judicial act against them, not just something everyone's born with universally. And unless you understand that, you're going to walk away with false teachings like Calvinistic doctrine. All right. And here is a question for Dr. Layton. Could the people who were unbelieving in John 6 turn to Jesus at the time Jesus was speaking, even if it was not granted by the Father? Well, I don't think they would because they didn't understand. You've got to understand something to believe it. Um, how will they believe in one whom they've not heard? Um, how will they hear without a preacher explaining it to them? Um, they can't. And so there is a cannot in Scripture, and the cannot is you cannot believe in something you don't know and understand. And they can't know and understand it because first they close their own eyes. And now God is strengthening them in their resolve and using parables to keep them in their already rebellious condition. It's only after he's raised up that we see the 3000 at Pentecost coming into the church. Well, because he's drawing them into himself at this point, he's starting to, to open the gospel to the world that people can understand and know. And it's through the drawing through the gospel that people are able to respond to the truth of who God is. But in John chapter six, he's not drawing all men to himself yet. Even I think Gabe would have to confess that it's not until he's raised up that he draws Jew and Gentile, even from his interpretation signs from some of all kinds, even on Gabe's perspective in John chapter six, which should help us understand the meaning of that text. All right. Marlon, you're hearing me okay? Is this okay? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. I, I a little bit during Dr. Flower's answer. I'm pretty sure I got the gist of it, though. I, I'm sorry. I, it's probably my internet connection. But to respond to Xavier, uh, the, uh, the 
uh, you're, yeah, you're touching on exactly what I had questioned Dr. Flowers about. Could there have been anyone there that could have turned to Jesus, even if it was not granted to them by the Father? No. And nor can Dr. Flowers give me an example from John 6 or any other text uh, that God has drawn people who will not believe in Jesus Christ. He said that I was making an argument from silence. Well, yeah, it's so silent, you can't find a single example of it in Scripture, of God having drawn somebody to Christ who therefore doesn't believe in Christ. So it is only those who are drawn by the Father who come to Jesus and have faith in him, and that is to the praise of his glorious grace. All right. And we have a super chat here, and the question is for Gabe. Gabe, what is the Greek word for all in John 12, 32? And does it mean the same as the word all in John chapter 6, verse 44, 45? I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to give you the answer to that question, but I appreciate it. I'll, I'll have to look that up and do a Greek study of that some other time. All right, Dr. Flowers. Well, in John 6, 65, I mean, see, it's 45. He's, I think he's referencing all have heard. Um, speaking of Israel in general, they have all heard, um, but only those who have listened and learned from the Father would come to Jesus. And so I, th I think that's the reference. Whereas in John chapter 12, verse 32, he's, he's referencing all in the world. In other words, um, I, I don't disagree necessarily the all without distinction aspects of John 12, 32, but just because something is all without distinction, Jew or Gentile, um, doesn't mean therefore it's not also all without exception. Just like I might say that in the land, you know, um, the, the laws apply to everybody, the upper class, lower class, everybody. Well, that's all without distinction because I'm trying to stop people from thinking just because you're rich, you can get away with disobeying the laws. And so if I was a sheriff saying everyone's subject to the laws of the land, upper class, lower class, well, that's all without distinction. But if somebody came along and said, oh, so you're saying some of the upper class and some of the lower class? No, it's, it's implicit within the comment that it's all without distinction, yes, but it's also all without exception. Everyone is under the law of the land. And I think the general tenor of all the scripture from John 3, 16, all the way to John 17, that these things have been known so that the world may know and believe that I am who I say I am. And so I think the, the cosmos, the world there being referenced is generally uh, all uh, without distinction, yes, but also all without exception in that context. All right. And here's a super chat. Um, this is from Xavier again. It's a similar question. Uh, it's probably almost like the same question that was just asked by Xavier. Um, this is for Layton. Uh, could the Jews in John 6 ultimately have chosen Christ, even though it was not granted to them by the Father at the time? Yeah. At that time, I guess would be the clarification there. Yeah, at that time. No. You can't right. believe in somebody you haven't heard or understood. Yeah, so let me let me read that again. So in John 6, all, uh, ultimately, oh, could the Jews in John 6, I'm sorry, ultimately have chosen Christ even though it was not granted them by the Father at that time? And, of course, Dr. Flowers and not I would a, answer not the at same. That time. Yeah. Yeah. Not at that time, but yes, later they could have, yes. All right. Oh, you think Jews there in John 6 later could have come to Christ? Sure. Yeah. Okay. When he raises, when he, when he's raised up and he draws all men to himself. Matter of fact, I, I would say it's almost certain that in Acts 2, when 3,000 come to faith, he said, you're the one who crucified him. Um, I mean, these, these are the same people who cried out, crucify him, the people of that land. And so it's, it's very likely that many of the people who walked away out of John chapter 6 ended up being some of the, the same crowd that, uh, that came to faith in Acts chapter 2. Uh, 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 Marlon, do you mind if I push back on that a little bit? Yeah, go ahead. I don't mind. Okay, so in John six sixty six, which again I read, um, uh, th that you would hear and understand the statement exactly. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So the implication there in that text in John 6 is that those disciples that walked away, they never came to Christ. These were those who were not drawn by the Father. They never came to Christ at any time, not here and not later either. Well, I, I think it could be just a reference that no longer walked with the Father while he was on earth. But once he's raised up and he sends the gospel, there's no reason to believe that some of those people who walked away earlier in his ministry could not have come back to faith. I don't think there's anything there that's explicit about that. The son, yeah, you said the father, but I know what you meant. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the son. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, next question here. We have another super chat here, and this is for Dr. Flowers. 
Does not John chapter 6 verse 37 make it obvious when looking at John chapter 6 verse 44? Why reject the obvious? Why the passion for refuted reformed theology? Well, what seems obvious to you, it, it, believe it or not, our reading and our understanding seems just as obvious to us. And so I understand where you're coming from, but it's like the old illustration that I've used dozens of times about the duck and the rabbit. It's the same picture, but it's both a duck and a rabbit. And you've read a text for so long, you see the duck, it's the duck, it's just obvious, it's the duck. And someone else comes along and goes, no, it's a rabbit. And unless you're willing to objectively back away and drop your lenses and just consider another perspective objectively, you're never really qualified to evaluate that other view objectively. And if you just think it's so obvious, then why has this been disputed among Christians for 2000 years? Like I said, even from John Chrysostom, talking about the Manichaeans leaping on this text to, to prove that we don't have any power over our own will. Um, and so th this, this has been a highly debated text. And so to be good objective Bereans, I think we have to be willing to objectively evaluate scholars from both positions. And if you're just going around going, well, it's obviously my reading is the exact one. I, I don't even take the time to listen to your reading. It's just gymna gymnastics. Well, to you, it may seem to, like gymnastics because you've not even really objectively considered our perspective. But that's what we're asking people to do in debates like this is to take the time to stop, put down your presuppositions like total inability and consider the fact that maybe the reasons that these people can't believe is not because of total inability, but because of judicial hardening. Because if that's the case, Calvinism has no leg to stand on. And that, that's a one point that has flowed this entire debate, in my estimation, that, that ultimately Gabe's never answered the ultimate reason that Israel cannot believe is not because of total inability, but because of judicial hardening. That's flowed to this entire debate. And unless you understand and, can, and he even admitted being confused by that from my perspective, sounds like it's the first time he's really considered it. I hope that he goes home and maybe thinks about this for a little while and comes to understand why we believe what we believe with regard to the hardening of Israel. Why speak in parables to people who can't believe truth because they're dead like corpses? Why even use parables in that sense? The reason parables are used is to keep them from understanding so that they remain in darkness until the right time. Why does he say don't tell anybody yet? They can't believe unless they're regenerated. It doesn't matter if you tell them or not. These kinds of things have to be considered from both perspectives. And in my estimation, Calvinists have rarely even thought long enough and hard enough about our position to really know how to refute it because they're so entrenched within their Calvinistic system that they don't see the logic of those on the other side. Pastor Gate. Well, in response to the statement that I, I said I was a little confused by that, I clarified the reason why I said that there was some confusion there is because you are a person who uh, advocates for the autonomous free will of the person, and yet you're talking about judicial hardening, which takes away a person's free will. That's why I'm confused by that. That seems to be uh, kind of inconsistent with your uh, with your hermeneutic. But coming back to the question here, so does not, does not John 6.37 make it obvious when looking at John 6.44, why reject the obvious? Why the passion refuting reform theology? Well, Dr. Flowers made that point about you've only seen it this way, so you need to put your presuppositions aside and view it this way. Dr. Flowers presents his ministry as somebody who has formerly been a Calvinist, and now he's arguing against Calvinism. Well, I was not ever uh, uh, raised up in reform theology. I didn't come into this until about a decade ago. So I have looked at this through lenses that were not reform theology before I came to understand proper exposition and exegesis in such a way I would agree with John that I believe that according to what John 637 says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And then 44, no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. I think the reading is pretty straightforward there. All right. Yeah, I do too. And we have another question here, another super chat, and this question is for Gabe. Same person. John, thank you. All right. Pastor Gay, I'm a huge fan of your channel. I'm finally, I finally know what you look like. <laughs> I got to say, sorry. I dig I the King I... Leonidas beard. <laughs> This doesn't feel all that regal to me, but I sure appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. All right. We have about... I know this isn't a question, but to, to kind of chime in on uh, Dr. Flowers, hey, I've appreciated some of that Calvinist look you've been sporting on Soteriology 101 when you grow that beard out. That's right. Yeah. Hey, I don't get a... Marlon, I don't get a chance to rebuttal his looks. <laughs> I, it's up to you, man. It's totally up to you, man. 
<laughs> I was, was going to say something about his, his face being made for radio or something, you know? I don't know. Oh, oh, ooh, yeah. Hey. <laughs> that's not, it's, it's actually not true, so it doesn't work, but. <laughs> good stuff, guys. Good stuff. All right. We have about eight more minutes and uh, probably more like five more minutes left in this, um, in this Q and A. So let's see if we can pound some of these lingering questions out. All right. So this question comes from Idol Killer. We all know him as Warren McGrew. Oh, we know idol killer that's right yeah it says if you if you were created spiritually dead and incapable of rightly understanding spiritual truth why should we trust the interpretation you're giving us tonight because i've been regenerated and i am filled with the holy spirit of god as a follower of the lord jesus christ that i might be able to discern spiritual things so as the Apostle Paul says in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the naturally minded man can't discern the spiritual things of God because they are spiritually discerned. I am not a naturally minded man. I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so though I once walked in deadness, though I was in darkness and in the sin and the futility of, uh, of my own dead soul, yet it is through the gospel that has been proclaimed to me, that my heart has been transformed from one that was in rebellion against God to now one who desires God and wants to worship and know God. And so because I am somebody who confesses the Lord Jesus Christ, you can trust the words that I have said uh, that truly come from God. But again, you know, as I said before, you test even what I say according to God's word. John said in 1 John, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Christ uh, this is one who is of God. And so uh, having that confession in the Lord Jesus Christ and according to his word, uh, I confess those words of God for the people of God. All right, late. Well, to answer the question um, that Warren is asking, um, why should I trust you and you to say, well, because I'm regenerated. Well, I'm regenerated too. Um, and therefore, it doesn't really answer the question unless you believe in libertarian freedom of the will of regenerated men to misinterpret passages. Um, otherwise, you've got a situation where God is decreeing sovereignly for some of his regenerated children to misunderstand certain texts. And that's not tenable. I think the reason we make mistakes is because of libertarian freedom. We have the ability to deliberate and to look at the text and to misjudge it at times or be influenced by false teachers and, and thus come to a wrong conclusion because libertarian free will is true. If Calvinism qua Calvinism is true and uh, the, under the concepts of compatibilistic determinism, then if I'm wrong, I'm wrong because God decreed for me to be wrong. And if, if Gabe's right, it's because God has decreed him to be right. But if, if Calvinism is not true, then I am defending rightly the interpretation of scripture and, um, and, and, and I think people need to recognize that the only tenable way or the only rational way to really even have a debate and discussion is if libertarian freedom is true. Otherwise, you've got God decreeing for some of his children to adopt false teachings. All right, all right. And two more questions and then we'll shut this thing down. And here's a question for you, Leighton. What does Jesus saying it is the spirit that gives life has to do with the conversation that Jesus was having with the unbelieving Jews in the flesh in verse 63? Well, we all agree it's the spirit who gives life, but who does the spirit give life to? That, that's the question. And, and the Calvinist admits it's a mystery. We don't know who he gives life or why he gives life to one person and not another. He just, that's just a, it's a unilateral, unconditional choice before the creation of the world. And they, we just don't know. Well, I believe it's the spirit who gives life to whom? To those who believe in him, to those who trust in his name, which is why I continue to read the scriptures over and over and over again, scriptures that my opponent actually introduced, like John 20, 31. By believing, you may have life. Okay, so believing before life. So the spirit gives life to who? The believing ones. Um, and so I... I, I he said earlier that I didn't use any verses or speak of any verses of God drawing. And Nehemiah 930 was one of those such verses. Um, God longing for and desiring the salvation of people or uh, desires that no one perishes. First Timothy 2, 4 and Second Peter 3, 9, uh, which I know he has broadcast on uh, contending with uh, our interpretation of those verses as well. But there are verses on our interpretation. If you don't assume uh, Helco means regeneration, there are many verses that speak of God's calling and his drawing that are resisted by people. And so I think it's important to understand um, that there are many verses that do indicate that God desires and longs for and provides uh, even for those who are resistant to his truth. All right, uh, Gabe. 
So yeah, the statement again in, in verse 63, Jesus saying, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But why is it that there are those among them who do not believe? Well, Jesus explains them. There are some that don't believe. Verse 65, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. The reason why they don't believe is because it's not granted by the Father to believe. All right. Mm -hmm. And here is the final question, and it's for you, Pastor Gabe. It's looking at what the Bible as a whole teaches about salvation relevant to eisegesis and this debate i think it's i think once again it probably means exegesis there but let me read it again it's looking at what the bible as a whole teaches about salvation relevant to exegesis and this debate hmm is looking at what the bible as a whole teaches about salvation relevant to exegesis in this debate the exegesis that I do here has to be consistent with what else is in Scripture, absolutely. But I think if we're doing proper exegesis with what is consistent with the text that we're actually reading, then it's going to be consistent with the rest of the Bible as well. You know, as we were, as we were setting up the debate, and even Dr. Flowers did not look at what the whole Bible teaches about salvation before uh, giving the arguments that he gave about John 6. He certainly used more passages than I did, but he didn't look at the Bible as a whole. Uh, and so uh, it is uh, it is necessary to be consistent, most certainly, uh, but with the allotted time that we have, I mean, how would I be able to prove that? That, again, is the Berean check that you're going to be doing, where you go to the Scriptures and evaluate and test what it is that we have said according to what the Bible says and make sure that it's consistent to the text. Did that make All sense? Right. I think that. <laughs> Dr. Flowers? Every expositional commentary that I know gives a not only a verse-by-verse -verse type of exegesis that usually starts broader. You start from the, the housetop view before you get down to the tabletop view. And, and that's because you have to understand what's going on historically. And, and it baffles me how some people don't think that the nation of Israel being hardened by the God of the universe, given eyes that cannot see, spiritual spirit, spiritual stupor, even says in chapter 11, the fact that God is blinding Israel in their unbelief, that that's not relevant to understanding passages like John 6, that baffles me. It is so relevant because it explains why he would be using parables like eat my flesh and drink my blood to this people. Why John chapter 12 39, when he says this is why they cannot believe, is not relevant to answer the question as to why they cannot believe in John chapter 6. I, I just think, wow, how can we be so blinded by our biases that we're not willing to look at the whole of the historical context of the New Testament and the hardening of Israel with regard to their um, the judicial hardening of God towards the nation of Israel and the uniqueness of that hardening toward the nation of Israel. He, he's not doing it arbitrarily. He's doing it as an act of a judge because of their rebellion not because that they were born that way and they couldn't help it as what's assumed by the Calvinists when they come to John 6, 44. And, and that's, that's why I'm trying to help people to remove those lenses of the preconception of total inability and, and, and recognize that total inability is inconsistent with judicial hardening. Because what is there to harden if you're born dead in the Calvinistic sense of dead? Um, there's nothing to harden. What is the use of parables if people are born? It's like putting a blindfold on a corpse. It doesn't make any sense. And so when you begin to question these things, I, I'm, I'm trying to do what I, happened to me. I was shocked out of my Calvinism when people begin to ask me those kinds of questions. And I begin to go, I hadn't thought about that before. You sound like a dude, just like what Gabe did. You, you sound like a Calvinist when you say stuff like that. That didn't, that didn't comport with free will. That's because I didn't understand what the people who are arguing for free will actually believed. And, and, and I just would challenge people like Gabe and others who might be listening to this, just take time to really understand your opponent before you just outright dismiss them as not being, uh, you know, uh, good Bereans or, or trying to be consistent with the text. Um, I've strived to do that. I will make mistakes because I'm free. <laughs> and, and therefore, I, yes, I, I, I want you to test me and I want you to go check the sources for yourself. Go read the scriptures for yourself. Gabe agrees with me on that. We all can make, we're all fallible. So uh, be good Bereans and go to the text and read it for you. And I would consider both sides objectively. All right. Marlon, you mind if I, if I say one thing in here? 
yeah actually this portion the debate the the, the q and is over um, i was actually going to say do you guys have any final words before i shut this thing down so whatever your final, final words word. are you got it man uh <laughs> any final words before i shut this thing down <laughs> All right, I'll take a few seconds here, and then Dr. Flowers, you can as well. I, I hope that uh, we have demonstrated for you respectful disagreement. Uh, Dr. Flowers and I are in disagreement on certain things, obviously, but we still consider one another brothers in the Lord. And so when we disagree online, even, uh, that we do this in a respectful way. And if somebody disagrees with you, be gracious in even how you hear that tone. You might hear that in like, oh. like a gruff that might be the way that you read it, but is that really what they intended? So just like we're reading from the scripture, understanding what the original author said to the original audience. So you even need to understand the author of the comments that are made to you as well. And don't just automatically jump to thinking that this, uh, this person is being mean to you. Most of all, what Dr. Flowers and I want, we both want this. We want you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and so be saved. The judgment of Amen. God is coming against this world. In fact, Jesus says it can happen at a day that you do not expect. So this day, right now, turn from your sin, put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, trust in him for salvation, and you have the promise of eternal life. And as Jesus said here in John 6, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. That's a great last word. I love it. Amen. All right, good stuff, guys. I appreciate you guys for coming on and, uh, and giving us a rundown. Hey, Layton, you better believe I'll still be in that live chat poking at you a little bit. And Gabe, I appreciate you so much, man. And, uh, hey, I sent out gifts. And, Layton, did you get the gift I sent you? Because I, I sent it a while one. ago. Oh, nice, nice. Good stuff. I did. Man. It's always, yeah. Uh, it's always good I sent to. You a thank uh, you. I sent you a thank you for it. I sent you a thank you. I didn't want you to think I didn't respond. I did send you a thank you on uh, Messenger. Okay, cool. I, I probably have to go back there, man. It's probably such a long time ago. You've been on the show, show before, so good stuff. But Gabe, I do send out gifts, so I'll be contacting you after the show to get the, the required uh, address or anything to send that gift uh, to you. But I do appreciate you guys for coming on and taking time at your busy schedules. And maybe perhaps we could do this again sometime, perhaps a different subject, and uh, bring you guys back on to discuss a little bit further on these things. All right? Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, take care. All right, another great debate in the books. And this was just as I expected and as I advertised the debate, one of the better debates of the year and one you did not want to miss. And I thank everyone out there for jumping in in a live chat. And I appreciate everyone that gave a super chat and supported the ministry. And, um, you know, good stuff, man. Good stuff. And as you know, uh, we have a whole bunch of other shows that are coming up here soon. So make sure you're looking out for those shows. We have a two on two debate coming up. We have uh, a Unitarian versus Christian debate coming up. I'll be in Arkansas to host a, a baptism debate. So there's going to be a whole lot of shows. And that's just the next four that are coming up. You got to go on the YouTube page and look at the upcoming live streams in order to get the full exhaustive library of shows that are coming up here in the future on the gospel truth but i just thank everyone out there for joining us and you know i encourage you guys to like and follow and subscribe to the gospel truth just so you will stay in the loop and not miss out so please do that before you jump out of this off this page and before you jump out of off of this um this platform make sure you're subscribing to the gospel truth so you don't miss out on anything all right please do please do make sure you do that and make sure you don't miss out or anything all right that said, I am going to get out of here. And once again, I appreciate Pastor Gabriel Hughes and Dr. Layton Flowers for joining me on this episode of The God's Truth. And I appreciate you for joining us in the live chat. So make sure to stay in, locked in, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Please do that. Support the ministry with a like or subscribe at the very least. All right. Once again, take care and may God bless you. God bless. Bye.